Strategic plan is the community's vision for the Central Coast for the next 10 years. It's called One Central Coast because this is the first plan for the whole of the Central Coast. We are one region, one council and one community. We live in a special place here on the coast, one in which we want all members of our community to feel valued and have access to a range of opportunities to participate in the richness of community life. And every one of us can play a part in bringing this community vision to life. If people feel part of a community in some way, they'll give without even probably even knowing they're doing it. I wanted to restore this building and get it back to what it was. It was the jewel of the crown and I wanted to get it back to that. Making a difference, I guess that's what we're really here for. The smile on the faces when they see these engines and that bus coming around, they just love it. If you're following what makes you happy and excited and interested, then you're definitely going to live a life that you will be thankful to have lived. At the end of the day, we just had a good idea. We needed the support of many people to turn that great idea into a sustainable venture. My name's Tim Silverwood. I grew up on the Central Coast. It wasn't until I got a bit older and started travelling around the world, I realised that what we had was so special because people don't always treat the environment as well as we do here on the Central Coast. Our programs have focused on going into schools and running events in communities. So we also have a huge global online audience. One man cannot solve these big global problems. It's going to take a tribe of people coming together to solve them. It's a really amazing and rewarding journey in, in spreading this message around the world. I've always been on the coast and I've loved the coast. About six years ago I bought the Chapman building. I, I got the opportunity, I saw that it was for sale and I stood back on the car park up there and a village central and I looked down and you know I could just feel this was the place to be. I could just see what the town was. There's always these little niches that are you know going back and forth and you know I guess it's an obsession for all of us because we saw what Wyong was like and it's getting it to a place where you know we're proud to say we're from Wyong. Like it's become a real proud place to be. My name's Chris Wallace, myself and my wife, uh, we own Community Fire Education and the Fun Engine. We educate the community in a different way. We teach people what to do in case of fire. One of the biggest things is, is our education bus. What we do, we go out to different fates, festivals, wherever we can go. When we do the, the bus sometimes, we get 2,000 through that bus. I just enjoy communicating and getting out there and just educating in a different way. I'm Meredith Gilmore. I've lived on the coast since 2000, originally from Sydney. Chose the coast because it's close to Sydney, but it's it's got that more laid back kind of thing that I like. I've, I like living in regional areas. I started visual art in my 40s. It's just so different from what I ever thought that I'd ever do and it, it is what led me into thinking it would be great to, to talk to people in the arts on the radio. So I started doing some shows, particularly a program called Coast Arts, which was a new show and I reached out into the community because I'm an artist as well. And I just felt like there was a lot of scope on the radio to do interviews with artists and poets and writers and that's been going now for over seven years. My name is Shana O'Brien. I am from the central coast of New South Wales on dark and young land and I'm a dancer. As an Indigenous dancer, we're very inspired by the environment and where we come from, all of the trees, the way that they curve around all of the rocks and the sea faces, the beautiful water, the fresh air, and that plays a huge part in the creative process. I was lucky enough to study at NASA Dance College, which was a super incredible experience. And the facilities, the studios are really beautiful, the staff are incredible, and I feel very privileged to have had that opportunity. Through volunteering, I was able to meet a bunch of really great other young people in the community that are really passionate about helping other people, and that's a way of taking something that I'm very passionate about and sharing that with other people. No matter where I go to work or uh, if I have to spend a lot of time in Sydney, I always come back to the Central Coast because it feels like home and it helps rejuvenate me. One of the things about the Central Coast I've noticed as well, which is 
people are so helpful to each other. They collaborate, they are interested in going to each other's exhibitions, not just to see what people are doing, but so that there are people there and you've got to be competitive, but you don't have to always be competitive with each other. If you're in a position to make a difference, I guess you're obliged to make that difference, really. Just happy to, you know, give it all I could and it became, you know, a local icon and a buzzing taste of day. The Community Strategic Plan is the community's vision for the Central Coast for the next 10 years. It's called One Central Coast because this is the first plan for the whole of the Central Coast. We are one region, one council and one community. We live in a special place here on the coast, one in which we want all members of our community to feel valued and have access to a range of opportunities to participate in the richness of community life. And every one of us can play a part in bringing this community vision to life. If people feel part of a community in some way, they'll give without even probably even knowing they're doing it. I wanted to restore this building and get it back to what it was. It was the jewel of the crown and I wanted to get it back to that. Making a difference, I guess that's what we're really here for. The smile on the faces when they see these engines and that bus coming around, they just love it. If you're following what makes you happy and excited and interested, then you're definitely going to live a life that you will be thankful to have lived. At the end of the day, we just had a good idea. We needed the support of many people to turn that great idea into a sustainable venture. My name's Tim Silverwood. I grew up on the Central Coast. It wasn't until I got a bit older and started travelling around the world I realised that what we had was so special because people don't always treat the environment as well as we do here on the Central Coast. Our programs have focused on going into schools and running events in communities. So we also have a huge global online audience. One man cannot solve these big global problems. It's going to take a tribe of people coming together to solve them. It's a really amazing and rewarding journey in, in spreading this message around the world. I've always been on the coast and I've loved the coast. About six years ago I bought the Chapman building. I, I got the opportunity, I saw that it was for sale and I stood back on the car park up there and a village central and I looked down and you know I could just feel this was the place to be. I could just see what the town was. There's always these little niches that are you know going back and forth and you know I guess it's an obsession for all of us because we saw what Wyong was like and it's getting it to a place where, you know, we're proud to say we're from Wyong. Like it's become a real proud place to be. My name's
Welcome councillors, staff and community members, both here in the gallery and those watching by webcast. I now declare the public forum open. We are holding this public forum today to hear from community members who have registered to speak on items before the council meeting tonight. I ask that the community members be listened to in silence and with respect. I would like to remind the speakers and indeed everyone here that this forum is being webcast. This means that your image and what you say will be broadcast live to the public and is also recorded. Please be mindful that what you say of what you say and avoid making statements that may defame or offend anyone here. Council is not responsible for your actions. Please switch off your mobile phones or onto silent for the duration of the forum. I ask everyone here to remain seated while the forum is underway. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of which we are meeting on the dark and young people and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Do any councillors or staff have any conflicts of interest to disclose in the matters being discussed at the forum? Councillor McGregor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to declare an insignificant non-pecuniary interest with the draft LEP discussion 2.1 as I know one of the speakers through my involvement in Central Coast Cricket but this does not prejudice my decision and I will stay in the room to vote on the matter. Thank you Councillor McGregor. There are no other lights on. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the speaker. So item 2.1, which is the deferred item, outcomes of the public exhibition of the draft Central Coast Local Environmental Plan and draft Central Coast Development Control Plan. We have Ms Sandra Kay to address council. And she is speaking against the motion. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Madam Mayor, before I start my three minutes, can we clarify whether um, Councillor uh, Vincent has a conflict of interest as his employer is a direct uh, competitor to my business? I believe the speaker has suggested that you are employed by somebody's in direct competition or mm. to her business. So are you declaring an interest? Um, you're the, you're the uh, recycling business at Lake Monmora there. That's, that's right, uh, Councillor Vincent. Um, okay. Uh, you've been a, a patron of mine uh, for quite a few years, but your employer actually produces um, ash, which is combined with um, uh, venom, and that is a, a product that is in direct competition to my business. Sorry, oh, yeah. Director? Through you, Madam Mayor, Councillor Vincent, I don't believe you need to declare a conflict, so I think we can move on to the speaker. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, that's a tough one because uh, declaring on this, if you do that, then that may have you declaring on every time the LEP comes up, so that could be a bit of a political manoeuvre. But I'm trying to think what the loss... So my employer supplies you with bottom ash, which you recycle and use? No, your employer sells that product to someone that recycles and uses against me. Orders, but with respect, it's not up to the speaker to ask a councillor about whether they should declare, and it's the decision of a councillor. Um, about um, that. That's right. Um, I'm, the Director of governance, governance has given you some advice, Councillor Vincent, so I guess you either make yes or no. Um, I think to err on the side of caution and seek some extra advice, and, but thank you for the Director of Governance for that advice. I think it was clear that you believed there was no conflict. And I might go through you, Madam Mayor, to the Director of Governance. In uh, an LEP review, it's a regional-wide review. And therefore, councillors who had houses in the LEP could be deemed to have a conflict of interest on the LEP because they're a resident 
in the LEP. So is there an exemption for councillors on LEP decisions? Councillor Vincent, there's no particular exemptions. As you know, it's for councillors to declare. My point was regarding the speaker does not have the right to request you to make a conflict of interest oh, declaration. That is a matter for you. Also, this is about speakers in the forum against broad matters. So it's up to you, but I, you do not have to respond to a request from a speaker. Oh, I see. Look, thank, thank you for that clarification. But I thank the speaker for raising this. Um, I'm not sure at the moment, so to err on the side of caution, I think it would be worthwhile um, leaving, but I'm not sure how much of this is warranted or how much of this may be a political manoeuvre, so I'll, I'll, but I'll err on the side of caution. Thank you. So, sorry, so you're now declaring, sorry, Councillor Vincent, you'll now have to make your declaration, so you're declaring on the matter and leaving. Sorry. I'll declare a, let me think. This is difficult because once you do this once and then if you seek advice, then that puts you in a position whether you're locked out of an LEP discussion. I guess uh, I'll need to seek further advice, but um, if it's an employable matter, then it's a pecuniary interest. And I think in, under that circ those circumstances, it's better to not be in the room on this occasion with this guest speaker on this particular item. And if we deal with the LEP in the future, then this particular item will have to be separated or hopefully separated from any decisions or discussions um, to enable me to be able to vote on any other parts of the LEP. But I'll declare a pecuniary um, significant and I'll leave the chamber for this presentation. No, Sorry, you. Councillor Burt, there is no point of order in a public forum. Well, well sorry. There's no point of order in a public forum, Councillor Vincent. You don't need to explain yourself. Uh, um, Councillor Burke, thank you for your question. I don't feel compel compelled to answer your question, so. Thank you. Speaker, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My name is Sandra Kay, Director of Wycop Proprietary Limited and owner of the regionally significant gravel quarry and resource recovery facility, AMS Recycling, at Crangan Bay. I'm against item 2.1 of tonight as the proposed E3 zoning severely impacts my business and the proposed remedy listed on page 172 of attachment two will cause massive fin financial losses to my family company. Our property was downzoned from 7B to E3 in the Wyong 2013 LEP. I am now seeking RU2 zoning to be consistent with all 7B Gosford LGA quarries under the 2014 LEP and now proposed CC LEP. I'm also seeking additional permitted uses lost in 2013. This is the same treatment which has been extended to Old Sydney Town on page two of attachment one of the business paper. These include post-quarrying activities nominated in our EIS of 1983. I lodged a 41-page submission by Matthew Fraser, independent planning barrister, after the public invitation on the 9th of December 2020, and council advised me last Friday, the 6th of March, that they will not consider this report. This is contrary to the advice on page six of attachment one of the business paper. Mr Fraser's report provides new information that details the downzoning to E3 was not necessary under Chapter 3.4 of the Wyong DCP, now kept in Chapter 5.47 of the now draft Central Coast DCP. Any green corridor issues in the North Wyongshire Structure Plan area could have been addressed at the DCP level under RU1 or RU2 zoning. I also lodged a submission to Major Amendment Number 2 of the Wyong LEP, which is part of this draft CC LEP. Therefore, Council's response listed on page 172, attachment 2, that this process is not the appropriate time to review my zoning is incorrect. I can't detail all the mistakes made by Council, but they continue on in tonight's business paper. Council's actions are not consistent with the public statements. 
Please rectify the problem as outlined in Appendix A of Mr Fraser's report. All I'm seeking is parity of treatment. Thank you very much. And I also point out the advertised statement, the CCLEP will provide a consistent approach to planning decisions across the whole of the Central Coast LGA. This is not happening to my quarry. All the other 7D, 7B quarries, including Palmdale, were zoned RG2. If you've got time, please ask me about road contributions, ministerial directions, um, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. I hope you um, can help me. Councillor Hogan. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, thank you, thank you, Sandra, for coming in. Um, one of the questions I have was in your submission, um, did your barrister, Mr Fraser, make recommendations as to how the council might deal with this matter following the detailed review? Uh, yes, he did. And I'd like to publicly thank you for taking the time to listen to me uh, for an hour last Friday. Um, in appendix um, uh, of the document, he recommended councillors consider a mapping amendment to rezone the Wycobb land to RU2 rural landscape and an instrument change to add additional permitted uses. Um, for the Gosford LEP 2014, as I said, the, the Gosford Council applied an RU2 zone to all 7B quarries. You must understand the Department of Resources and Energy on four different occasions sent an agency submission to Council requesting RU1. I'm not seeking that tonight as reported in the business paper. My advice is to get parity and consistency of treatment and seek RU2. I've given you those agency agreements and all the councillors have been given an email um, last week that I sent to uh, the Deputy Opposition Leader showing how those agency submissions were not treated as per protocol. One was not um, advertised, it, it wasn't exhibited, clauses were added, the reporting was added. Councillors were told there were no Section 117 issues in 2016. You have to understand that we went to the first major amendment in 2016 and all the councillors, Labor, Liberal, Independent, unanimously agreed for a review. They didn't get the opportunity. Now, the staff refused to send, re send the report back to council as required under resolution. I then had to go to the expense of lodging a further submission in 2017 just to up the ante. Instead, that business paper has a letter dated the 10th of June 2014 by Mr Cox and that contains significant errors and omissions. Our zoning history was not reported correctly after 1977. You have to understand, when we agreed to our 1983 um, consent, it required a resumption of land to fulfil road infrastructure requirements. We had to pay monetary, a monetary comp, uh, contribution. In this day and age, it would be called a VPA. I'm sure someone will get there and say, I'm not on the VPA register because that didn't exist until the late 80s. Our family has engaged in long-term planning. You can't get any longer than having worked for 55 years with a goal in mind to have this council move the goalposts at the last minute. And the galling aspect of it is, is that all the additional uses they've taken off me have been retained on the council land next door. Now, staff will say, oh, that's because it was zone 6A and it gets converted to RE1. Well, the reality is RE1 zoning has a zone objective to provide for biodiversity corridors. So one would assume that the assessment of what zoning um, development rights you can do under RE1 where you're providing for a green corridor should be applicable to my property next door. Now, for the people that are uh, very interested in the environmental aspect of the LEP, you have to go away at, 
at the break and ask yourselves why the council is proposing to zone all their land RE1 and at the same time remove this zoning objective. And my answer is, you're imposing this impost on the private landowner. This is expropriation by stealth. Every time I have put in a submission to this council, the council has never addressed it fully. Now, I'm a fair and reasonable person and I've paid business rates all my life. I've paid land tax all my life. But the actual attitude and behaviour of the staff here is a governance issue. You've only got to see with what I've detailed tonight. The public, the public impression that is given by public statements, workshops and everything is vastly different to what happens in the back rooms when people are getting assessed. I'm Thanks, Ms Kay. I think you've kind of answered the question. Yeah. Um, there are some more questions. Thank you. Councillor Best. Thank you, Sandra. Hello, Councillor Best. <laughs> hello, hello, Ms Kerr. Um, I just want to get this right. Was a lot of my colleagues, it's a big shire, it's a monster, and they're not familiar with, and a lot of documents you've obviously spent a lot of time on. So to, to drill this right down, you've got a quarry, a disused quarry. No, no, excuse what, me. Sorry. It's, it's, a, it's an operating Op quarry yep, assessed operating. regionally significant. Yep. It's got significant reserves and a concrete resource recovery facility. Yep, okay. So you've got a quarry operational, it's been there for 50 years, and now you're looking at an environmental corridor zone coming upon you. Yes, and uh, as you are aware, uh, Councillor Best, um, uh, under the Wyong um, LEP, there were and still are existing resolutions saying that you cannot put a corridor on private land. Yes, and next door, council land is being treated exceedingly differently with development right. Yes, that's right. Right next door. Yes, adjoining and, my land, I can walk through the fence. And equivalent sites to what you have now in other areas have been treated differently. Equivalent 7B zoning sites have all been zoned RU2. Hmm. Both, I, both in Wyong and Gosford. I'd particularly like at this point to ask questions of the staff, but the way this council's crafted the transparency, I have no ability to ask staff, but I will later. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sundstrom. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Ms Kay, can you advise why Wycobb can't just put in a, a planning proposal as recommended by staff? Yeah, thank you very much for that um, uh, question, uh, Councillor Sundstrom. I actually raised this issue in my submission last year. Uh, our company put in four submissions to the um, Central Coast LEP. Now, um, under ministerial directions, um, uh, 1.3b, you're not to zone a property which affects the actual viability or potential development of the land. Because we've owned this property since 1954, we actually have capital gains tax status, capital gains free tax status. And Council's proposal that I lodge a planning proposal just to recover what I had, mind you, this was supposed to be a process where it was um, like for like. And it was also supposed to be a process that, that the activity of the land um, be as assigned a zoning that um, is appropriate. Um, if I put in a planning proposal, I lose a massive amounts of um, uh, tax, tax liabilities. And Council, um, and I'm sure Councillor Hogan has um, discussed this with you um, in camera, Council is very aware of the uh, uh, financial details of my property. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for offering um, the uh, landowners to uh, submit a further submission um, at the meeting in December. Councillor Hogan. Just a last question to round it off, Sandra. Yeah. Just in layman's terms, if the zoning was E3, what would that do to your business? I, I'm currently got my hands tied behind my back. I can't attract an operator to 
operate the quarry at its full capacity. You have to understand this property was the supplier to Wyong Council during the period of the 70s, 80s and 90s. The minute they removed extractive industries from the 7B zoning, and we don't need to go into the circumstances behind that, you have to understand that the other quarry that had that happen is now getting them restored. The minute ex extractive industries was removed, I was not in a position to be able to attract high quality operators to run my land. Alter and, and also, no person will look at this property um, for a quarry operation as, as E3. Now, I itemised all this in my submission to the second major amendment. I had a valuation report done by a local valuer explaining the actual economic um, losses of the um, zoning and the removal of my additional permitted uses. I also had a um, my industrial real estate agent advise them that he can't attract suitable buyers. So this all relates to the ministerial directions. You also uh, have to be aware that the, if they had followed protocol from day dot, from the very first step, we were listed as rural resource and not in the Green Corridor in the Central Coast Regional Strategy, page 12. There's a map. Now, staff lied about that in the draft exhibition documents. You know when they set up an LEP, they have to go through the justification and, and the uh, SRRPs or ministerial directions and SEPPs and all the rest of the stuff. They didn't state that this was the position. And from that point onwards, it's a bit like the fruit from the poisonous tree. And every time I've come in and put in, an, put in a submission, the staff write these reports that have no content. content. And as I said, all the councillors, including Madam Mayor, recognised this last time and voted for a review. Um, Thank you, Ms Kay. Yep. That you've answered. Thank you. That's it? Yep, that's it. Thank, thank you very you. much, councillors. I hope you can help me. I'd also like to publicly thank um, the opposition, um, uh, deputy opposition leader for her assistance as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now invite Ms Sue Stedman to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Sue Steedman. I'm a member of the Copacabana Community Association Management Committee and I'm here to speak against the motion to adopt the draft consolidated LEP DCP uh, on behalf of the community and particularly on behalf of small coastal suburbs where local character will be impacted and diminished by changes to R2 zoning rules proposed in the LEP. I want to make two key points. One, that the council should defer the adoption of the LEP until after the draft urban spatial plan and the local strategic planning statement are finalised and the community has been properly consulted. And two, that the council should not apply blanket rules under R2 zonings, which in the draft align with provisions under the former Wyong council, and that council should defer adoption and consider alternatives. Regarding the first point, my comment is that the DUSP is currently under consideration after community consultation and has not yet been finalised. The draft LSPS, the guiding strategic vision for the Central Coast, has not yet been released for the community to comment on. Both of these planning statements have broader strategic implications for the coast, against which the LEP should be measured and re-examined. The current process, adopting the LEP DCP first, is flawed as it has inverted these approval and consultation processes and does not take into account longer term objectives and strategies for the whole of the Central Coast. Um, regarding the second point on blanket rules, there is precedent across other council LGAs for council to apply different rules to different locations zoned R2 in the LGA in order to protect and preserve local character. There does not have to be a one-size-fits-all approach to zoning rules. 
the CCA has provided evidence of these precedents in our most recent submission sent last week. Councillors should be mindful that the local character statements created by the former Gosford Council are still relevant and deserve to be respected. They have provided important grounds for successful defences against inappropriate development in the past. Despite verbal assurances that places like COPA will not be adversely affected by the changes, it is clear that new rules proposed for R2 zones are designed to increase population densities, smaller lot sizes for dual occup occupancies and subdivisions, and less open space requirements plus smaller setbacks mean that garden and tree canop canopies will inevitably be lost. Small coastal villages such as Copacabana, with one road in and out, are already stretched to breaking point with infrastructure that is inadequate and barely coping with current vehicle, tourist and residential traffic and pressure on essential utilities. We request that Council considers a different approach to zoning rules rather than simply applying the Wyong rules to all wards. The southeastern ward particularly deserves to be protected from new rules that will effectively destroy local character, which residents and tourists alike highly value. Sorry, Ms Stedman, sorry, your time has expired. I've got one more sentence. Okay. We believe that councillors have a responsibility to ensure that unique small communities such as ours are protected from inappropriate or overdevelopment and should instead focus on increasing densities in areas such as the CBDs, which are better suited and adequately resourced to support such increases. Thank you. There are no lights on, so thank you. I'd now like to invite Mr Peter Campbell to address council and he's for the item. Thank you. Good evening, one and all. <clears throat> Peter Campbell's my name. Um, we were lucky enough to find a uh, block of land in the old what they call Model Farms Estate, which is at Enerina, developed in 1885, and uh, it was called Churchy on Erina. We, I live on one of the 15 blocks that's remnant in this development. Council resumed a lot of this land many years ago when they put uh, Well Street through over Yerin Bridge over to Barralong Road. You may have a picture of where I am. But we're down on the lower side, and uh, this was in the old days when there was paper subdivisions. There is a road at the back of us, but of course it's only a paper, paper road. It's actually a creek. So <laughs> that's the sort of thing that went on in those days. I'm here to support the council, the staff recommendation in regard to deferring what's classified as environmental and urban edge zone review. I think the staff have done a wonderful job on this, uh, trying to fit the, uh, the older style of IDO 122 into the new regular plans is most difficult. When uh, the fact sheets come out about this proposal, and my proposal was uh, that the, the lands where we are, there's 15 of these one and a quarter acre blocks still, um, that the um, proposal was to turn this, the, uh, of the whole of this land at the moment is 7C2. It hasn't stopped any development, the, the whole, whole of the 15 blocks had been developed the houses on it, and we're all very happy there. Um, but um, in the, uh, in the uh, fact sheets it says, this analysis was performed in a spatial mapping platform to include consideration of environmental constraints, available infrastructure, and adjoining landscapes. Also states further through, a plan, the plan acknowledges there may be pockets of land available on the urban fringe that are suitable for development investigations will identify these areas that can be efficiently serviced and avoid development in areas with higher environmental values and hazards. That's exactly what we are. Um, there is no need, to, so the proposal is to split the zone there. Where all the houses are is to turn that into E3 and to leave the rest of the land as E2. There is no disadvantage in leaving the whole of the land E2 from 7C2. However, if it goes to E3, it does allow for additional housing to be developed there, and that's not suitable. The land is not suitable. It is flood prone land. Um, it is bushfire hazard. Uh, there is no town water available. We don't want it. 
There is no town sewage available. We don't want it. There is no town gas supply available. We don't want it. And there is flooding there. Uh, and um, many years ago, I spoke before I bought this property, I spoke to Vic Tyso, and Vic Tyso's advice to me, Mr Campbell, there will never be any further development here because it's flood prone um, and uh, there is no, no suitability of emergency vehicles coming in. So we, it's only a uh, half Mr Campbell, road. I'm sorry, your time has expired. Okay, thank yeah. you. But I, I really support the staff to defer this uh, urban edge zone review. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are no questions, so thank you, Mr Campbell. I'd now like to invite Ravi Sharma to the podium to speak in favour of item 2.1. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon in support of the proposed LEP and DCP to be merged into a, a consolidated uh, instrument and uh, develop con control plan. Uh, the LEP has been in draft mode for over two years um, and currently there are seven planning controls if you include the draft instruments um, within the Wyong and Gosford area. Um, this makes a uh, very uh, a difficult landscape for developers and planners to uh, put forward development proposals and DAs within the region. Um, I think you really have an opportunity tonight to alleviate that issue and to, to go forward with a, um, pu putting forward another cog in, in, in amalgamating the council as pro proclaimed by the state in um, 2016. Um, well aware that the sensitive um, uh, conservation lands under the um, interim development order number 122 is proposed to be deferred. Um, I believe um, planning planners across and developers across uh, the coast are aware of that and we, we support that. Um, in a perfect world it, it would have been um, sorted out and coming across um, earlier but essentially what we're seeing with the, the draft LEP is focusing on, on the residential and the industrial commercial land within the, in the area. In, a, in regards to the issues that have been raised in regards to the LEP coming across such as lot sizes, the, um, to be honest, the 450 square metre lot sizes that are available under the, the Wyong LEP that are coming across to the, to the consolidated LEP, there isn't much flat land it's all infill land on the coast um, to be available to, to, to be brought into a 450 lot um, is, is commensurate with what's occurring across the state and across Wyong. Um, it, uh, when you look at the DCP provisions, all the steeper land greater than 15% will actually be, have to be larger than what's currently available under the DC, Gosford DC, or the, uh, DCP. So we're looking at a substantial change. All those lands that are on the fringe of COS lands and conservation zones will have to be much larger. The other thing, the dual ox in R2, they are a superior housing stock when you compare it to a granny flat. Granny flats are becoming a bane of, of young people trying to get into the market. They provide no Section 94 contributions for infrastructure such as sewer and water, roads, curb and gutter. It's, they don't require any parking and at the moment there's no new titles available under granny flats or secondary dwellings as opposed to dual occupancy development. The dual locks are a superior housing stock. If you look at your draft um, alternative and affordable housing strategy that came through last year, that is a, another housing topology that's available for young people to actually afford a house as opposed to being pushed out by investors. So there's a there's many other reasons. Mr. Sharma, why. sorry, your time has expired. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are no questions, so thank you. I'd now like to invite Mr. Eaton to the stand, um, the podium for item 3.4, the presentation of the financial reports and related auditors' reports. And you thank are speaking for that matter. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillors, I just wish to draw your attention to the actual content of the audit report. Um, which sadly is just in the annexure and basically on pages 223 to 225. And it should be of significant concern, in fact, great concern to you. 
because the auditor says the following significant matters came to our attention during the audit and have been assessed as high risk. I'll repeat that. They've been assessed as high risk. In 25 years in council, at least in my own council, I've never seen an audit notation like that. The next sentence, council demonstrated poor governance. Again, I'll repeat that, poor governance. So we've got high risk and we've got poor governance. It's not a very good look. Going over the page, here's some of the facts. Council agreed in the annual engagement plan dated 18th of March 2019 to submit the general purpose financial statements, special purpose statements, special schedules, water supply, general purpose financial stations, etc., by the 13th of September 2019, obviously to meet the uh, uh, statutory deadline of the end of October. The financial statements were delayed and a robust quality review process was not evident. Again, I'll repeat that. A robust quality review process was not evident. The auditors couldn't check the figures. That's what that tells you. That's a significant failure of management. I mean, I don't understand how um, the general manager in particular um, uh, can just uh, produce this report without any explanation. Not that it's his report, it's the auditor's report. The financial statements were delayed and a quality ro robust review process was not evidence. This was largely due to information system initiatives and weaknesses in the council control environment. You've got serious problems here, councillors. Very serious problems. I'll just make some brief comments too um, on the actual accounts, uh, which is part obviously of the audited statement. Um, and that is that the council failed four out of the eight local government benchmarks. So you could regard that as a pass, I suppose, 50%. Not very good though, is it? Four out of eight. So it failed cash flows, it failed to make an operating surplus. That's one. Um, it failed to meet the uh, ratio, the benchmark in terms of uh, outstanding rates percentage. I would have to concede that I don't think that's all that important um, for the Central Coast. It had never made that uh, ratio. But the other two are critical as part from the operating loss and that is infrastructure. So your infrastructure backlog is getting worse. You um, are not maintaining Mr. Eaton, your infrastructure. Mr Eaton, sorry, your time has expired. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. There are I no questions. Oh, no, no, on. I had actually finished, so it's fine. Well, okay, <laughs> Councillor Best, but I'm just going to stay there. Um, thank you for coming in and sharing that. Um, you've come to the lectern to um, give us some advice, and you know, that's fine. What's your experience to do that, Electon, Doug? Um, well, I suppose 25 years in local government, um, uh, six years as mayor, um, uh, qualifications, legal solicitor for 40 something years now, and a degree in accounting, accounting from the University of New South Wales with merit. Doug, you drew us to, um, to a, a part of the audit report which is well down on the report, very hard to find and uh, very difficult to scroll to. Um, says in red print, significant audit issues you, you referred to. The report goes on to say that council demonstrated poor governance over local infrastructure contributions collected under the EP&A Act. The council used funds collected under section 7.11 contributions to pay administration expenses. Now, they were forced to pay those back at 13.2 million, but what's the What's the net effect of doing something like that in the accounts? Just, I mean, we've got a $5.3 million loss on this year. What, what does that do? Well, it doesn't affect this year, but in previous years... No, when it, that, yeah. well, in previous years when it was happening, obviously, um, the uh, Section 94 funds were being um, milked to pay for um, administration expenses, which otherwise would have been operational and would have reduced your operational... Um, sorry, would have increased your operational expenditure, so made your results worse. Hmm. What, um, what do you say can be done to fix this? You've got a lot of experience. You've come here to give us a warning. What, uh, where to from here do you see? Well, you've got a huge problem with um, your, your current accounting controls. Um, I'm not sure what the internal auditor is. Um, Why do you say that? Oh, that's what the report says. I just thought I'd ask you. High risk. <laughs> um, 
um, poor governance. That's what it's saying. You know, and you, you've made the council, and I'm not, this is not, I, I am trying to be um, uh, ass of assistance to the councillors in particular. Um, you have staff that says in March last year, yeah, everything's hunky-dory, we'll be ready for the audit as usual in September. You get to September and it's a mess. I mean, that's being polite. I could use much worse words than that. Um, and yeah, you've got a, a counts as a result that um, now point out the problems in terms of the audit um, and that they're four or five months behind. And my understanding is, because I know the processes, budgets start preparation in about December. Um, they're pretty much finalised by March. <coughs> So you can't do anything about this year's figures, it's too late to do that, and you're pretty much stuffed in terms of next year's budget. So really, to craft a budget as we're trying to do now, you really got one arm tied behind your back. Well, it you? would be much preferable to have these figures back in October when they're due, and when you're starting to prepare your budget. I don't think anyone would argue with that. And look, finally, um, comparisons in, in, in Wyong um, with, with where we are now. Yeah, thanks, um, Councillor Best. So um, probably the interesting one is that Wong ran on 28% of wages to income, 28% wages to income. Uh, Central Coast Council is at 34% wages to income, very high. And the difference between those two figures is $40 million. $40 million. So, so you're and my understanding is that's about the loss you're predicting um, this year. So you're saying the general rate, the general rate is generating around $165 million and wages are $220 million, yep. roughly. That's it. That so, includes, of course, so the we're, agency. We're spending, oh. another, we're spending far more than we are raising in general rates in wages. Yeah, that's correct. 1.3%. Ne ne nearly one and a half times, yeah. And where does that go? What, where, where does that... Well, it goes into an increasing operating loss and, of course, at the end of the day, that's money that you're not spending on services. I mean, the, the, uh, if I can give you a very crude summary of what you've done, you've paid people more money and had more people to do less things. Thank you. Um, Mr Eaton, you can stay there now. And if you want to um, address us on item number 6.2, which is the notice of motion, 9 million oh, agency okay. agreements body hire. No, that's okay. I'm just, while you're there, I okay. might as well get you All just right. to continue on. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Madam Mayor. Can I just have a second because I wasn't quite ready to do that? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillors, again I come before you just to point out some issues um, with um, body hire, of course, labour hire. And I just thought to start with, I'd actually read again some of the executive summary from the 430 report into Wyong Shire in 2007, which was actually um, released in 2010 or 2011. Um, and the report says, the executive summary says, Council's practice in relation to the engagement and management body high contractors did not only in some respects fail to comply with councillors, council statutory obligations, but more fundamentally fail to meet basic probity and good governance requirements or to provide any assurance the council would receive best value for money in relation to the services provided. With respect to the general manager, his note, which uh, I have seen, doesn't address that issue whatsoever. Um, it goes on about the contracts that exceeded $150,000. Again, the general manager lists, I think, four different um, contracts. One of them is a local government procurement contract. That's certainly not subject to tendering but the others, in my opinion, would be subject to tendering. And again, there's no information about whether they were or whether they weren't. And it goes on to say that basically what happened is a number of the contracts lent by the then General Manager of Wyong Council uh, were kept under the $150,000 tender limit and then extended and extended. And again, that issue hasn't been raised or, or addressed um, in terms of the note from the General Manager. So all of these things are still issues that are unresolved. And then temporary personnel were, were appointed to positions and, and held those positions for a period exceeding 12 months. 
So that's some of what uh, we don't know about. The justification, this is interesting, the justification used for Council for its failure to comply with statutory obligations were they were employment contracts and therefore exempt. And that wasn't what was found by the Department of Local Government. <clears throat> Even if it was accepted that they were, it would not be unreasonable to expect as a matter of appropriate governance that it would ensure that body hire contractors were never, nonetheless engaged person to an, pursuant to an open, transparent and competitive process. Has that happened? I don't think anyone knows whether that's happened. And then it goes on, the system, systematic nature of the maladministration revealed by this investigation suggests the existence of a culture of indifference towards this council's statutory obligations and appropriate government practices. I have to say that the report from the general manager tonight exhibits exactly that same hubris. And I should say that it was the governing body of Wyong Shire, the councillors, who actually took this matter up against the wishes of the then general manager and pursued it such that the department came in, made its recommendations and the end result was that the general manager ended up uh, to be fair, not taking up any further um, engagement at council. So I'll just go through some of the recommendations. Recommendation one, council should establish a procedural requirement that ensures any former staff may only be engaged by council as a contractor, pursuant into a competitive process, and the appointment process is independently reviewed. So are any of these labour hire people former staff? Don't know. Council's internal auditors should undertake regular audits to ensure compliance with the procedures governing the engagement and management of temporary contract personnel. personnel sorry. The last audit, according to the general manager, was in 2014, six years ago. Council should amend staff delegations to ensure the delegation to vary contract is defined by reference to the voter value of the expenditure inclusive of all variations. So what came after this at uh, Wyong is when there was a contract that initially was under but later uh, exceeded the $150,000 cap, it was reported to Council. Sorry, Mr Eaton, your time has expired. Councillor Best, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Doug, for drawing it to our attention. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's Christmas. Just going click click here. Yeah, no.
Councillor Best. Well, you can you can um, have a go at that, and if you can't come back, well, questions. We'll be fine. There's some things you can't come back from. I know that. Um, right. Thank you, um, Doug, for helping us with your history on the body hire issue and the importance of this issue. Um, if I could, um, the history of this, I, I, I believe it was um, uh, Labor Councillor Kath Foster that, that actually raised this issue initially at Wild Council and, and then created ultimately this report along with the unions. Am I correct in that remembrance? Um, I wouldn't, uh, I think that's probably right. I certainly think it came um, through the unions um, into the Labor, probably councillors, but whether it was Councillor Foster at the time, I wouldn't be 100% sure. Um, but I was f pretty sure that's where it came from. They were pretty mad. Though everyone was very concerned once they heard about it. Could I ask you, um, in, in the general manager's response to the motion, it, it's, it's, it's very 2007-esque, the response, as you said. Um, on about eight occasions it says this motion is unnecessary um, and that we should get a staff report. God bless the staff report. What do you say to us getting a staff report on this issue? Well, and, and what does the Act say about this as well? OK, well, that's two questions. So oh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, try, talk I'll about staff report. I mean, I think it's self-evident that you don't get um, potentially the wrongdoer to investigate themselves. Where's the independence in that process? Um, you know, it really does... Um, look like what happened at Wyong in 2007, that it was, there's nothing to see here, there's nothing to see here, and there was. Mm. So, um, so coming to the Act, I mean, the Local Government Act is actually quite detailed about how staff are to be employed. Chapter 11 actually says, how are councils staffed? And it goes through. Section 332, you've got to determine the structure. And that's each person within the structure. So all of these positions. Um, and you know, I mean, I would have thought councillors knew that one. And then you go down to section 348. When it is proposed to make an appointment to a position with the organisation structure of council, so you've got the organisation structure, it says there's going to be a <coughs> a level three engineer here. So you want to fill that position. When it's proposed to make an appointment to a position with the organisation of structure, the position must be advertised in a manner sufficient to enable suitably qualified persons to apply. And then, when the decision is made to appoint a person, section 349, to a position, only a person who has applied for the appointment to the position may be appointed and the one who has applied, who has the greatest merit, is to be appointed, 349.1. And the only time that that doesn't apply is in temporary positions for sick leave and things like that, up to 12 months. And then 352, and this is pretty relevant in terms of this issue. A member of staff of a council is not subject direction by the council. We're talking about people here who are not members of staff. They are employed by a third party who will give them direction. So that's a direct breach of the Act. Other work, 353. A member of staff must not engage for remuneration in private employment or contract work outside the service of the council. So what's that saying is that People who are employed by council can only work for council. You can get, to be fair, an exemption um, and it might to do something separate. But you're talking about people here, and to give you an example, say, say you've got an IT contractor, and I know there's IT contractors, and they're employed by IBM. And I don't know if IBM, I suspect IBM doesn't have a contract. But say they did. They're getting paid every week or every month by IBM. They're not being paid by council. IBM is getting paid by council. So who are they going to listen to? And the issue is they may well listen to IBM. They put in all IBM systems, and this is just a hypothetical. I'm not accusing IBM of anything. Um, 
and council doesn't get a great decision, doesn't get good value for money, doesn't get the systems that it should get. The conflict of interest is so obvious and that's why these provisions are there in the Act. And at first glance, you have to say there's clearly a breach of sections of the Act. Look, finally, if I can, um, the reporting on this is critical to the Council. I raised it at the last meeting and the Councillor said, Let, let's get some more information. Uh, the staff quite clearly are wanting to report on it um, for obvious reasons. Saying that the OLG, uh, the, the Department of Local Government's not the authority to do it, although this 400 page document came from the OLG on my own council's foray. Where should it go, Doug, from your legal and uh, accounting background? Where do you think, does the motion cover it off enough asking for it to be looked at by the OLG? Um, and, and by the way, I'm not asking for us to cease any body hire arrangements now. I am asking for them not to be continued later, not, not, not cutting up contracts. Sure. Oh, look, I, I, there is no other agency. I mean, in the end, when you've got a concern like this, they are the appropriate agency. I mean, there, there is no suggestion, and I'm certainly not suggesting, um, anything um, that's been done um, with malice or for an improper purpose. But you've got what appears to be on the face of it, a breach of the Act. They're the ones who control the Act. That's where you've got to go. That's where Wyong had to go. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr Eaton, just in something you said, I think you said that the last audit of this was 2014, is that correct? You that made... was what was in the General Manager's note, yes. Right, okay. Um, so that would have been why on Council. Can you just clarify, correct. were you Mayor at the time? Uh, I was Mayor when the report was handed down. Right, so you were Mayor from, I think, 2012 to 2016, is that correct? Yes, correct. And so you'd had this report, this adverse finding, and the last audit was in 2014, and then you didn't do anything about it, is that correct? No, you didn't no. follow so up? The, so the report was in, um, uh, so the, the activity went from 2007 to 2010. The report was handed down, I think, in 2011. Yep. Um, at that time, or slightly shortly before then, the former general manager had retired, a new general manager was appointed and all of the recommendations in the report were then um, uh, implemented and were signed off on. So under Wyong Council, the problem had been resolved. Okay, but the clarification is, I think you suggested that it was inappropriate that there had only the last audit was 2014. This was at a time when you were mayor, you'd had this adverse finding of the Wyong Council and in your legal and accounting expertise, you didn't then follow up to make sure there was a further audit is my understanding of what you're saying as me. No, no, you're, you're trying to put words in my mouth, of course, Council. Um, what I said was in relation to the general manager's comment that there was an audit in 2014, which is now six years ago. Okay, but that was at the period that you were at Mayor. Mayor. That's correct. Yes, that's right. And, the, and, the and so you had direct day-to-day -day If you could let me answer, ability to you don't want to let me answer, follow up on this. Well, I'm just trying to clarify. I, I can see that you're trying to provide some um, logic, uh, but it just doesn't seem very logical in my mind. So it's not logical that the matter had been cleared up at Wyong Council and that was confirmed, so the matter was clean, cleaned up by 2012 and there was a check audit in 2014 that resolved that and there was no changes because I was mayor and I knew that it hadn't changed. And then what changed obviously was the merger in 2016. Okay, but from 2014 you didn't put anything in place to then um, do sort of continual review, I think, is, is, is that yes, correct? Yes, so, okay, so thank you for that. So as I said, for instance, what we did, and this was happening, was when there was a contract that was initially um, uh, tendered by the council for less than $150,000, so it didn't come to council to be reported on, but then subsequently went over that, those contracts were reported as well. So there was a number of checks that were in place and were reported on and were checked by the council to make sure they were reported upon. Okay, but you didn't put in any further process of audit? There was no other recommendation. All of the recommend. Okay, no, thank you. All Mr. of the Eaton, recommendations were impl yep. implemented by Lyon Council. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Ta. Uh, there are no other speakers, so thank you, Mr. Eaton. Thank you. I now invite uh, Ms. Jelena to address Council on item 3.8.
and she is for the National General Assembly of Local Government. Thank you. Thank you, councillors and visitors. Um, I'm here this evening uh, to represent the contractor, the non-profit contractor for Council's Animal Care Facility at uh, the northern part of the Shire in Charmhaven. Um, as such, we're, um, we're very familiar with the issues of roaming cats in this area and uh, that, that matter was brought to the Central Coast Animal Care Committee for their support to actually introduce or ask a council to introduce a cat curfew. curfew. <laughs> um, so tonight I'd like to speak briefly about that. Um, we process hundreds of cats every year up at Charmhaven and m the majority of those are trapped by uh, local residents. Um, they're seen to be roaming, although under the Companion Animals Act they're free to do so but they're trapped and brought to our facility or left in the overnight cages. Very few of those animals, because of the low um, microchipping rate in cats, very few of those are able to be returned to their original owners. Um, we do keep them and we manage to rehome them through different facilities, but it's a problem mainly, uh, the impact is mainly on the wildlife of this area. Um, I've got stats here about how many um, birds are supposed to be killed by roaming cats in Australia every year and I'm shocked to see that it's supposed to be 337 million animals or cat, um, birds are destroyed by cats, both feral and domestic cats every year. Uh, these stats were compiled by a council in Adelaide a year ago and they put a um, survey out to the residents of that uh, town with all of this information that I have here for councillors if they're interested in, in seeing it. And that, um, the response they received from the residents from 526 um, uh, submissions was 76% of the residents of that area voted to have a cat curfew and it has been implemented for the last year which has been working very well. So the residents of the area did want that, curf that curfew. I know that um, the, uh, the residents of this area have not been surveyed at this point in time, but I ask that council seriously consider either conducting a survey or actually implementing a cat curfew from um, 8 p.m. of an evening to 7 a.m. in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Best. Thank you, Marilyn, for coming in. And, and for all your team and volunteers at Our Pound, you do a, a wonderful job. It's much appreciated. Um, this curfew that we've talked about, it comes off the back of the uh, incorrectly named CAT Committee, um, the Animal Cares yes. Committee for dogs, cats and everybody else. Um, look, this is a national push. Uh, clearly, if we don't try and step up to this at a higher level, the borders are no, no match for these creatures, none at all. It's got to be national, hasn't it? Absolutely, but we've got to start somewhere. And you said 337 million... Yes, annually. ...wildlife deaths occur. I, I wouldn't like to be the counter on that one, but I'm <laughs> sure it's, it's, to the, it's to the number. But if I divide that out by six, just a pull out of the air number of animals, of, of cats killing an animal, that's 56 million cats. <laughs> no, no, that when they go out of an evening, it's been recorded they can kill up to a dozen animals just in that foray. That's what I'm saying. If I divide the 37, 337 million by six, I end up with 56 million cats or foxes or whatever's killing the native wildlife. So divided it's... by the nights per year as well. Yeah, yeah, okay, divided by the nights, yes. all right. <laughs> it's a lot of cats. It is, it all is. All right, so it counts as on the right page here, you think? Um, I think that uh, the Central Coast Council's taken some big leaps in, in, um, in uh, putting out to tender the, their facilities and that has worked very successfully, saved um, the, the area money and also meant that we have the lowest kill rate in all of Australia, 1.8% at Charmhaven. So I think that's something that they've already done and I feel that um, this could be the next step in leading the way. And if um, 
Mount Macedon Council's done it, and very successfully. And um, if we were to do it, bit by bit, other council areas will too. Wonderful. Thank you for coming this evening, Marilyn. Right. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to invite uh, Mr Morgan on item 6.3. And while you're there, I will get you to go on to 6.5 as well. So notice the motion investigation of the um, Newcastle Airport Opportunities for and 6.5 for the Notice of Motion Council requests the um, CEO to investigate revenue options and modelling for the Central Coast Council. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity to come and speak before the Council again. I was here uh, eight months ago uh, speaking on issues to do with uh, Warner Vale Airport. Uh, and I do note that at this time those issues do appear to be continuing to drag on, which is very disappointing. However, I am here to speak in support uh, of this Council seeking to uh, reach out to Newcastle Airport. Uh, seeking to build a relationship with that airport uh, because it's actually in the interest of the Central Coast to have aviation. However, I am concerned that this motion uh, does not appear to take into consideration the extensive work uh, that was already undertaken uh, in the Council uh, spending close to half a million dollars in developing its aviation hub proposal, the half billion dollar baby that the Central Coast Council is sitting on top of right now that could be delivering the benefits to which the council is seeking now to obtain from another city's airport. And I do find it awfully uh, odd uh, in that whilst I'm in support and AOPA is in support of the council building this relationship, that it appears the council is actually building a pathway to try and hand away the opportunities uh, that can be gained from having a productive working airport in the region. And what I'm worried about here is I'm worried about whether the ratepayers, the people who support this region, uh, want to be sending their general aviation community away to Newcastle, whether the ratepayers want to be sending its air freight away from Newcastle and building the success of Newcastle, because the last time I checked, the Central Coast Council was supposed to be about promoting the Central Coast. It was supposed to be, or my understanding is, it's here to actually invest in the Central Coast and to build capability for the Central Coast. And so a formal relationship with Newcastle, I hope, uh, would be structured in a way in which it would actually bring business to the Central Coast, and so I'm, we'll be quite eager to learn how Newcastle Airport can actually bring aviation tourism into this region. We'll be quite eager to hear about how Newcastle Airport can deliver success for general aviation here on the Central Coast when Newcastle has very little general aviation. We'll be seeking to understand how Newcastle would be prepared to give up its growing and burgeoning aerospace and aviation hub that they've started and sending it here to the Central Coast, which I highly doubt will happen. So we are in support of it. We're in support of it from a perspective that it appears that Councillor Jane Smith has had a come to Jesus moment, that aviation means something to the Central Coast. It has a value to the Central Coast. And she's wanting to understand all of that benefit that her half billion dollar baby, the half billion dollar economic opportunity in the uh, aviation hub plan can deliver for the Central Coast. And so, in support of this motion, what I think should happen is that council should actually add a few points to it, that this particular relationship uh, should be explored with an understanding as to how it contrasts and compares to the half billion dollars. Sorry, dollar. your time has expired, but Councillor Best has a question for you. Um, thanks, Ben, for coming this evening. Thank you. Um, it may well be a re eureka moment for us all. Um, you talked about general aviation, and, and as I understand it, and I'm no expert in this area, um, Newcastle Airport really doesn't run the general aviation. Um, you don't have um, trainee pilots like young Tash who came in here doing Cessna touch and goes between FA-18s, do they? No, they don't. Uh, Newcastle Airport is actually quite unique in that it is split between defence activities and civil activities, and so that the civil side of the airport uh, <coughs> is most exclusively for the airline industry. Uh, and, and I, I guess off the airport itself, and but within the airport perimeter, they've now built their uh, their aerospace hub. Uh, and I was up there not not that long ago, councillor, and it uh, it really is going ahead in leaps and bounds. And as someone that is from the central coast, I think I told everybody the last time I was here, I was from Tookley. As someone that's actually from the central coast, it's a it's a great shame that as the leader of AOPA here in Australia, I have to stand before this council watching a $500 million plan sit there in the background, uh, going nowhere, and watching the general aviation industry have no opportunity. And in fact, councillor, there's a general aviation business right now at Camden that's facing unsustainable increases in rents, and they look like they may be leaving Camden 
and instead of coming to the central coast, where actually they're a perfect fit, they're now looking at going south. And so I just look at it and I think to myself, what a wasted opportunity, what a, so, what a wasted opportunity. So Ben, is. this motion as you read it and as I read it, it, it doesn't seek to, to stop the airport hub that we currently uh, use or enjoy as a community. It seeks to look at tourism because we've not got tourism at the airport yet or anything. We've, and it doesn't do air freight out the airport. So this is a complementary motion to, to sustaining what we currently do at Warnervale, is it not? Because these are clearly things that you wouldn't do at Warnervale. I mean, a lot of the things you wouldn't do. You wouldn't do air freight traffic and you wouldn't... I don't think we're going to be dropping in, you know, A380s or anything. Well, Councillor, I think to start to answer that question is, first of all, in all my travels around the world, mm. great cities pride themselves on having a strong and vibrant aviation community and an airport because mm. it's a signal that the, the city or the region is big enough to support trade and commerce. It's a gateway. It opens the door to so much opportunity. We say in aviation that a mile of runway will take you anywhere, and it's so true. And so this motion, as I see it, uh, is a recognition from this council that aviation is actually very important to the Central Coast. It's mm. actually intrinsic to the long-term success of the Central Coast. And what I hope that this relationship will yield is a direct <coughs> understanding as to just how valuable Warnervale Airport truly is to the future of this region, to the future of young people in this region, to the future of technical trade uh, jobs, to the future of the economy of the Central Coast. And it may, in fact, hopefully pave the way for a recognition that the half billion dollar airport uh, development plan that's sitting on the table right now mm. finally sees the light of day and is activated so that we can help contribute because after all from what I'm hearing this council needs a few dollars and I think that the money that this airport could be generating towards the long-term success of the community uh, is exceptionally valuable and I think that it would add a huge dynamic and look to finally the capability. Um, you understand the aviation industry extremely well um, I, I look for examples that that reflect this motion and, and our airport hub we currently enjoy. And the nearest I can come to it, and I'll be asking Mr Murphy this later, because he's the architect of it actually, that's the Lismore Airport, which is a success story in its own right on the back of Mr Murphy's efforts. It doesn't compete with Ballina, which is um, tourism and air passenger traffic of a, high, a higher number. And it's only 36 and a half kilometres away from Lismore to Ballina, but they both coexist quite effectively, don't they? Look, absolutely, and I, I just go back to making the comment again. Cities and regions take pride in the fact that they have successful airports that contribute. The federal government puts up, I think last year, they put up $250 million uh, in grants. I noticed it didn't look like that the Central Coast Council was accessing any of that money to help activate that half billion dollar plan that sits at the moment in a cupboard not seeing the daylight, hidden from public view. And I just don't understand. I don't understand why we, we are not seeing here on the Central Coast this council embracing the opportunity to create jobs, to create success, to create revenue, to create the type of growth that the Central Coast wants and needs. And I uh, make this comment again. I think I made the statement last time that I viewed the failure to move Warnervale Airport forward over the last 20, year, 20 years was a sad, De uh, description of the magnitude of this council and where it sits today, and I'll say it again. I was Thank here you. eight uh, months ago, and the council still think hasn't you've answered moved the forward. question, Councillor Greenaway. Uh, yes, I just wanted you to clarify, if you would. Sometimes we do have people that watch the live stream, and you've mentioned quite a few times about the half billion dollar Central Coast Aviation Hub document and all that. So I just thought, could you clarify, please, that it's half a like. It's 500,000, not half a billion. Sorry, $500 million of economic contribution. Oh, but you talked about the plan itself. So you, you're not saying the plan costs that. I think it was you reported to somewhere. It was like 400 and something thousand. That was, and so half a million, 400 and something thousand. Okay. I'm splitting well, as long hairs. as it's half a million. I think if we compare that to the council's current Thank you. Position, you've answered that question. Hands. No, thank just you were saying half a billion instead of Okay, half a thank you. I think uh, Councillor Pillen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ben, for coming in thank again you, tonight. Um, I, I too commend this um, motion from the deputy, but I also, the wording in here says a, a preliminary investigation into opportunity for a formal relationship. Now, to me, any successful relationship goes both ways uh, rather than one way. And um, I did actually ask the deputy tonight whether she would be happy to include in there 
that we that the CEO looks at what are our opportunities for our current Central Coast Airport to give back, not only to our region but to the Newcastle region, so that we're not just um, looking to who can help us and what are we going to receive from Newcastle, but yep. what we can actually do for ourselves and for other regions. Is this something that you would support an amendment to this motion to, to have this investigation into what we can actually do as a Central Coast Airport, not just the Newcastle Airport to us? So, Councillor, the first time I read this, I thought it might have been written by the CEO of Newcastle Airport. Um, and I did have to read it a couple of times because I thought, wow, they've really played uh, this, uh, this motion well. They've asked the Central Coast to give them their aviation industry. Uh, I don't know about too many trade negotiations or regional deals like this, but I can't imagine as you have rightfully indicated, that it would benefit the Central Coast to hand away uh, what the Aviation Business Hub plan describes as a half billion dollar economic driver for the region. So I agree with you, the wording of this motion, and I do support it. I do support the councillor in coming to the realisation that aviation is important. But the wording of this motion most certainly does need to be reviewed. I feel that it needs to take into direct consideration opportunities that are also within the general aviation industry, calling for submissions from all of the aviation bodies towards this effort. It also needs to include the work that has already been performed for this half billion dollar airport uh, development plan that's hidden in a cupboard, so that we can ensure that this agreement, in fact, delivers a two-way trade agreement. If, in fact, it's even in the interest of the Central Coast to allow another, uh, another city another region to hold the rights to this most precious asset. Thank you very much. Appreciate your answer. Uh, there are, are no further questions, so if you can go straight on to um, your, the four for item 6.3, the notice of motion for yep. the um, CEO to investigate revenue options and modelling for the Central Coast Council. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, this one has really got me floored. Um, You're sorry? speaking for it? Uh, no, it was supposed to be against this. Um, it says four. Okay. Well, okay, I can speak for it, oh, don't worry. Yep, that, that's all right, I can speak for it. Um, wow, when I first got sent this, I, this one really knocked me off my shoes because I was pretty certain this had been written by Karl Marx himself. But it's actually written by a councillor here of this council, which is frightening. I understand the council needs to generate revenue and I think that this is actually a fantastic concept. But I, I, I really lament and I think on what's gone on in the last 20 years with Warner Vale Airport, that here is in fact a revenue generating asset right in front of the council, but the council can't see the airport for the sake of the trees. And it really does astound me uh, that this motion, which really kind of presents to me as almost like a political manifesto, than it does really a motion for a local council, because I thought councils were about roads and rates and sewers and all those essential things we need to support and grow a community. But in this motion, it's outlined that the council needs to generate revenue, but we really shouldn't impose any fees or charges uh, or anything on anyone within the community in order to achieve this particular outcome. And so I look back at the aviation industry and I ask myself, well, why as users of the council-owned airport do we pay fees and charges? <laughs> and it's quite an irony, isn't it? It's an irony that we have a, a motion before the council to argue for the very thing that I spend just about every day of my life arguing against. And so I think it is actually a good idea that this council takes the steps to research where it can generate revenue. And I'd like to see the aviation industry at the absolute top, the absolute top of that list, because we've got a half billion dollar baby sitting at Warnervale, that half billion dollar airport uh, business hub that is ready and roaring to go. I know of a large list of companies that would absolutely love the opportunity to relocate themselves from Sydney Bankstown and Sydney Camden and probably Wollongong Airport. We're plugged in to the entire aviation industry uh, and we would love to see those opportunities brought forward. Because after all, isn't this, isn't this what it's supposed to be? Are we not here to grow the community? And what about our young people? Our young people can benefit from this revenue generating uh, exercise. If we can just find a way to unlock that business plan and drag it out of the cupboard where it sits in silence, put it in front of the community, take consultation on it, put it into action. We may not need to provide increases elsewhere. We might be able to generate that revenue that's desperately needed. But I lament if 20 years are anything to go by, it may not happen and that's what I really fear most. So I do support in part Councillor McGregor's uh, motion. I think it's important that the council addresses its losses, 
I think it's important that the council sets itself as an example for community and operates itself uh, to a strong financial standard. And I think that the aviation industry here in Australia and the aviation industry here in your own backyard uh, can really be helping you achieve that goal. Thank you. Um, Councillor Vincent. Oh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr Morgan, thanks for coming in and talking to us. That's an interesting address you've given. Um, you're talking about, you're obviously looking to try and expand the airport or do something with it. What would you say to the 50,000 residents in the Budgiewoy wards and the Wyong wards that would have to um, live with the airport and aircraft and noise in their backyards? I think I would drag their attention to the recent bushfires in Australia and I would highlight the role and the invaluable commitment that our aviation industry has provided the broader community. Our pilots and air crews put their lives on the line. Our industry provides the infrastructure and the resources to battle these fires. And in some cases, our community have paid the ultimate sacrifice to protect home, property, people, wildlife uh, and bushland. And whilst the airport is not exclusively used by emergency services, uh, it's the diverse uh, mix of commercial activities that help fund an airport so it's always at the ready and available when a time of need calls. To those in the community that would like to argue that airports just simply create noise, I think what we have to understand is that we could also argue that sporting ovals create unnecessary noise. I've met residents that live opposite ovals who've complained flat out that they hate the sound of people playing in an oval. There are people that sad. I've heard people complain about the noises of buses and trucks on their street, saying that it's unreasonable that they have to have a transport corridor near them. If we allow our thinking with respect to advancing Australia's infrastructure needs to be limited by the minority, then we will never go forward. We will simply engage in a race to the bottom. And how do we serve the greater good of the residents of the Central Coast if we focus ourselves firmly in looking in the rear view mirror instead of looking forward. Um, thanks for that detailed response, Mr Morgan. So um, you did acknowledge that there was extra noise and you did acknowledge that that would affect people. And what would you say to the 50,000 people that could be adversely affected by the negative externality of an airport in the Budgiewoy and the Wyong wards if their property values were decreased? It's just not the case. We've seen around the country that wherever airports are placed, housing is slowly built right up to the very corridor and that housing's enjoyed the same rates of growth as, as housing in other areas. I mean, I've got situations right now where I've got uh, housing right up to the boundaries of airports that are now worth so much money that they want to get rid of the airport and fill in the rest with more houses because the developers want their piece of the pie. And so there is always going to be fear mongering. There's always going to be those that want to try and argue an extreme edge of the argument as being a justification to stop something. But I would argue this, if a major fire a major fire broke out here on the central coast and required large air tankers and all the other equipment to be bought in, and those air tankers have to operate from half an hour away or three quarters of an hour away, do you know how much damage can be done in half an hour in a brutal wind fueled uh, fire? Extreme amounts of damage. And so I would say to the 50,000 people, this community airport, and that's what it is, it's a community airport, Nobody within the aviation industry is pushing for this airport to fly jets. No one's pushing for it to become a major regional airline uh, airfield. This community airport, airfield is there to provide for the community. It's there to provide in the good. It's there to provide uh, in, the, in the bad. And we all make sacrifices every single day of our lives as to things that we can justify and we don't justify. I don't use public libraries, yet I don't run around and advocate against public libraries because the internet's cheaper. I don't happen to use sporting ovals, which I probably should get out and use a sporting oval once in a time. But I don't advocate to close those sporting ovals because I have a prejudice against them. And so I think the airport's the same. If we allow the voices of the minorities to run the roost here, we will forever go backwards until there is nowhere else to go. And then I think we'll become really good friends with Mr Marks. Thank you. Um, Mr Morgan, you said that there were you knew of uh, aeroplane operators or pilots that were looking to relocate because they were in areas where they were being charged commercial rates for use at an airport. Is that, did I hear that wrong? Is that how you uh, no, well, phrase it? Yes and no. Uh, I right now could put the council in contact with a fantastic organisation that has an 80 year lineage at Camden Airport. Uh, probably one of the most environmentally friendly aviation organisations you could get your hands on, a glider club. 
They fly sailplanes. It's a sport and recreation. In fact, sailplanes are so popular, they have a world sporting event for it that Narromine has out in the country. And AOPRA as an organisation is partnered with Narromine Council to promote Narromine Airfield, and that gliding competition is a huge component. But this glider club is now facing a 225% increase in rent from Sydney Metro Airports. And Sydney Metro Airports, of course, is owned by First State Super. They've bought these two airports. There's now a monopoly, or well, there's actually been a monopoly, of privatised ownership in the Sydney Basin. And all of these general aviation companies are slowly being forced out of business because they just want to keep ratcheting that rent. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Every year, ka-ching, the rent goes up. And right now, that Glider Club issued a press statement as of yesterday saying that they can't accept the rental increases and now they need to either close or find a new home. Now, what an amazing thing it would be for the Central Coast to capture an 80-year-old club with hundreds of sailplane members flying the most environmentally friendly aircraft there is. But I lament because at the moment, the reputation within the industry and the words out of the glider club themselves is they wouldn't even waste their time coming to Warner Vale because the impression that everybody has right across the aviation industry is the central coast is closed for aviation business. Um, thanks, Mr Morgan. Do you, do you think that the um, Central Coast Council should be charging commercial rates for users at the airport or should they be subsidising it? Well, according to Councillor McGregor, he doesn't believe they should pay anything. I support that, but I'm also a pragmatist. I'm a capitalist at heart. I'm sorry, Councillor McGregor, I just can't buy in entirely. But yes, we should. Our industry has no objection. It has no objection with contributing on a user pay basis. All that we have ever sought as an industry is for an equitable user pay arrangement. And what I would encourage is if we could look at unlocking that 500, uh, sorry, 500 million dollar, half billion dollar baby, we as the industry would like to work with this council in seeking every application that is available to us jointly to encourage as much development that would enhance the environment around the airport, that would enhance the community's access to the airport, would enhance the commercial appeal of that airport because we want to drive people to the Central Coast. I would love to transfer the head office of AOPA Australia to the Central Coast and move back here to the Central Coast and advocate for a future for general aviation being a resident of the Central Coast. Nothing would do me uh, you know, more pleasure or make me more proud than to be able to come back. But I'm in Sydney because I cannot be here on the Central Coast and participate in aviation. And I'm sorry, I'm, I don't want to be uh, mean, but I buy into a little bit of Councillor McGregor's positioning here and his friends, uh, his uh, co-political friends, which is I don't want to be burning fuel every day going up and down the freeway when I could have an opportunity here to live, to work, to grow, to succeed on the Central Coast. And, I, and is that unreasonable? Is that an unreasonable aspiration? And I, I just can't think that it is. Um, it may or may not be, Mr Morgan, I'm not sure, but what would you say to, say, 50,000 ratepayers in the Budgiewoy and Wyong wards who are saying that they would like to see their rates go into roads, footpaths, parks, and it offends them to think that they would be spending council money rates um, on an airport. And in their minds, they think that airports in general are federal government and state government issues. Well, first of all, we stand with you in arguing that the cost of running these airports should belong with the federal government. And you will find no louder proponent of that argument uh, than the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia. We believe that councils uh, who were transferred airports under the ALOP were literally sold a pup. You were given the asset and you were expected to carry the baby. Now, for as strong and as powerful as an advocate as I am with AOPA, I am unable to influence the federal government and to encourage the government to have a moratorium to allow you to hand these airports over and let them take care of it. So in the absence of that, it then uh, falls back on the council to have to fund these airports. The problem here is that there are, the problem is not that there are 50,000 residents of Budgiewoy that will argue that the airport is an unnecessary investment. Because just in the same argument that you'll say the airport may be unnecessary, there will be a large number of people in the community who believe that maintaining a dog park, if they're not dog lovers, is a wasted investment. There'll be people within the community that just don't go to that public library and can't understand why millions of dollars have been spent to build and then millions of dollars spent to maintain a library. And so these arguments are, in my opinion, rhetorical arguments that are used to simply 
almost cheat off the cuff. I think that most residents, most residents, when, when you sit down and you have a meaningful engagement with them, understand the value of protecting an asset for community access that will protect homes, lives, property, wildlife and bushland. I think most residents understand the value of an airport from a perspective of uh, obviously trade and commerce. And so for the 50,000 people at Budgie Boy, if you've got young people, are these people honestly saying to you they don't want technical trade jobs, aerospace technical jobs, computer aerospace and aviation technical jobs, flying jobs, aircraft maintenance jobs? Are they honestly saying they don't want to originate this, this employment and this economic value in their own backyard? I don't think so. Um, thank you, Mr Morgan. Some people, just to answer your question, some people from the Budgie Woy and the Wyong Wards are saying that they didn't move up from Sydney, sell up and move up to buy their $600 McMansion in the Warnervale, Mungara, Watanabe, Wadalba, Canmore, Charmhaven, Bluehaven areas to have airplanes flowing over the top of them, but we'll just come back um, one step. So the cost to local government to do the approvals and to bring this airport forward in previous councils was somewhere in the order of $500 million, half a billion dollars, which would come out of local government coffers. So you're here advocating that we should be spending something in that order for of ratepayers' money to to bring this airport to fruition? Well, Councillor, I, I think I can answer that, uh, Councillor. And um, my, my first response to it is no, I'm not standing before you today to say spend $500 million. It does not cost you $500 million to start activating the plan and allowing general aviation businesses to start engaging with the Council in negotiation to setting up here on the Central Coast. It will not cost the Council $500 million to relocate the Glider Club from Sydney, whom have a $250,000 government grant to build a facility in their hands right now. It will not cost the council 500 billion, and I doubt it would cost the council 250,000 in approvals to move that club, nor would it cost the council uh, significant sums of money to work with organisations like AOPA to identify other companies that want to come forward. I know of no end of private aviators that would love to be able to participate in building hangar complexes and whatnot, but I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. I think the reality is, is that step one in any plan is to actually commit. Step two in the plan is to start working through all the requirements and to, to arrive at a strategy in which we understand what needs to be done as an immediate step, what needs to be done as a secondary step, what needs to be done as a third step. But I think the first and the most fundamental step that we need to move towards is providing assurance and certainty with regard to the Warnervale Airport and making a decision that this council wants aviation to be part of the fabric of the future of this region. Thanks, Mr Morgan. I think you have answered the question. In light of the fact that we've still got another speaker, um, I'm going to move on. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, uh, Mr Carrier. But now, if you okay. come and speak for not, notice the motion 6.4, Gosford Waterfront Marina. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for the time. Uh, look, I just uh, want to take three minutes just to put something to you. Um, I am a, a resident. I live in Terrigal. Uh, I've been here 30 years. I chose to be on the Central Coast. I worked in Sydney uh, until about 18 months ago uh, and did the freeway every single day. In fact, I think I counted that I'd uh, done the tr uh, freeway something like 8,500 times. Uh, having lived in Terrigal and driving down through Gosford every day, uh, I go past the Gosford forefront every single day. Beautiful place. I then also travel. We have a motorhome, my wife and I, and we've uh, spent a, bit, a fair bit of time in the last uh, 18 months travelling around Australia. And we go to some beautiful marinas. And we've always questioned why there is not a beautiful marina in Gosford, if I'm really honest. And I think I'm not the only person that, that would think that. Uh, and I'm sure there are really good reasons, and I'm sure you, uh, you folks have, uh, have been through this uh, a few times before. But I notice uh, on a, on a, uh, a Facebook, because everybody watches, uh, does Facebook these days, obviously, uh, that my wife uh, subscribes to, and it says that um, there is a proposal that maybe this council would like to look at a proposal for, for looking at that marina again. And I guess I just want to make a personal plea. I'm, I'm here as a resident, as I say, for 30 years, is please look at it please have a look and see what you can do. Because every single place we have been to, and I'm talking about places in WA, I'm talking about 
places in uh, Adelaide, I'm talking about you know, Port Stevens, I'm talking about uh, places down in Wollongong, well, our marinas, people are just happy. And if there's one thing we need in this world today is happiness, I believe. And I really would, uh, would ask you to look to see if you can't um, you know, go out to, to expression of interest or whatever the technical term is. I'm not quite sure what that, the, 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 the right phrase is. But get, go out and ask some people, hey, you know, what can we do here? It doesn't have to cost the council anything. I understand there are some, you know, in fact, very in insightful this evening, just uh, sat in this room and hearing how many uh, you know, fiscal issues you have. You know, it doesn't have to cost you anything to go out to, to, to someone to actually propose um, something back to you that says, hey, this is what commercially you could do. And then think about the income that maybe this council can uh, derive from that. From what I understand, that, that that waterfront there is actually owned by the council, so it's not something you have to sell, it's something you can probably lease out. Hey, great opportunity for you to, uh, to get some revenue. Look, I'm uh, 30 seconds uh, before my close. That's all I really wanted to say. Thank you. Councillor McLaughlin. Yeah, thanks for coming in, Phil. Um, just Oops. you could just tell the people your 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 uh, previous position and sure. who you worked for. And I was a director at Microsoft for 30 years. That's right, and you obviously dealt with the, the executive um, executives in Sydney. And I mentioned you last, when you came here last time. You said it was very hard to get the executives to come up to the coast. Yeah, yeah. sure. Look, I don't think there's um, there's any executives from Microsoft or many, many corporations that will be on the coast. I think the previous speaker, I think he said that he had to move back down to Sydney for, for reasons for that. We chose to be here. I was the only person in the family that did that every, every day, so, so be it. But one of the things I would say in terms of that, that role I did perform within Microsoft is we had many, many opportunities where partners and, and business um, executives would come to us and actually say, hey, how do you invest with Microsoft? How do you actually do this? And as a board of directors, you know, it was incumbent on us, on us to look at every single opportunity, particularly if there was a revenue opportunity, to make sure we did everything we could to, to one, make sure we took after our shareholders. Your shareholders, I suspect, are uh, myself as a right pair and everybody, probably everybody else in this room. You know, those are the, some of the things that we would look at. Hey, let's make sure we look and, and, and go through a really good business plan to understand what the, uh, the, the benefit is to the shareholders. It's not about us in this room. It's really about the shareholders, uh, the right payers. Okay, thanks, Phil. Councillor Gar. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Phil Carrier, thank you for coming in and speaking on this particular motion. Can you give us, as you've just pointed out, um, as a commuter of, hmm. you said, 18 and a half thousand times, what kind Eight of an impact? Did I say 18? Eight and a half thousand. Oh, sorry. Still a lot of time, let me tell you. Over, over a million kilometres, just to put it in, in perspective. Yeah, amazing. Um, What's your thoughts around a fast ferry um, and the impact that that would have on someone that's a commuter or has commuted Look, such I as work with many people, or did work with many people that lived in Manly and that, that coastal area around there, and they used to do so much work and, and enjoy the trip. Uh, I suspect if you used a, a modern day ferry today, I don't know anything about the technology, but I can guarantee, you know, I, I uh, uh, used to work with many people that um, used to work in Japan and so forth and, and the trains up there and so forth. Modern commuting today, can, can be, make you very, very productive and can give you the opportunity to do lots of stuff that, um, that you wouldn't do if you're driving. Now, sure, you know, Mr. Tesla will say you're going to do that in a car one day. I personally think it's some way off, so a ferry will be huge. Thank you. Councillor Burke. You just turned yourself off. Hey, look, I, I'm not an expert on it. I'm just here as a, as a resident, to be honest. But I just look at how many marinas that I go to. And I actually said to my wife this, uh, this afternoon before I came here, marinas just make people happy. You go to Port Stephens, and you just look at the people, the kids running around, guys with their fishing rods, whatever it might be. And I think there is this perception that is for the rich and that the guys with the, with the big boats are going to come and, and uh, you know, moor their boats there. I don't think that's the case. Certainly isn't the case up in Port Stephens. We used to go on holiday up there. I think probably 18 times we've been up there on holiday with our caravan. Let me tell you, the people up there, sure, there are those guys that, are, that, are, that have got money that want to you know, moor their boats there. Actually, they're probably a little more in the boats there, paying lots of money to the council and actually probably not using it much as well. So, you know, got to bear that in mind. 
But I, I think um, you know, people are just generally happy in those sort of areas. You can see it. Water and boats is great. Yeah, absolutely. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr Carey, I was just wondering, are you aware of the previous proposals for the fast ferry? Yeah, look, um, there was probably one that I can remember a long, long time ago, probably 20 years ago, actually. Wasn't the one going to come out of Woi Woi or someone like that? No, no, no. There were proposals to come from Gosford and okay. they pretty much were not viable for a whole range of reasons. Okay. So you not across those? Not in any detail, no. no. OK. I, I stand here as a resident just... Honestly, just going, hey, give this a chance, guys, please. Uh, well, well, they have been given a chance and they've been okay. shown to be not viable. Okay. Um, so I so guess you're talking my... about the ferry there, not just the marina, though. I, I think the marina is a, is a completely different... You go down the path of the ferry, sure, maybe that's some other commercial reasons there, but it's not just a ferry, in my opinion. It's about the whole area there. If you're doing great stuff in Gosford, hey, where are people going to you know, come to? You know, I really hope Gosford takes off, and I think the plans you've got there are fantastic. But you do actually need some, something else other than a, a great botanic garden or whatever you're building in the front there. But I think you need something on the waterfront. Uh, thanks, Mr Carrier. And ju just in terms of your support for the marina, I'm, I mean, you're probably aware about the dredging issues and the who pays debate. Um, who, who are you thinking would pay for the upkeep uh, of the dredging for, <laughs> to allow the marina to I, happen? I think if you, if you put a good commercial terms to somebody, then the person that actually has maintains the lease, you know, the person you're going to lease it to, that should be part and parcel of those. So all the way be. through Brisbane Water to access the ocean? Look, I, I don't know the details. I really, you know, you're okay. asking me questions here. I'm, I'm not prepared to answer because I, I don't have the, 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 you know, the knowledge okay. of it. Okay. And you're but not what, aware of the contaminated soils issue there? Hey, no? look, you know, I am aware of that. Yeah. And, and look, here's, here's my take on it. Mm -hmm. I have a very good friend that's got some melanomas. Okay. Some they what? don't Sorry? melanomas, you know, skin cancer. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. you don't just leave those skin cancers on your skin, you actually get them removed. If you really think there is something bad down there, why wouldn't you as a council try and get rid of it? Why would you just leave it there? Uh, look, there's a whole lot of engineering science around that that I probably aren't going to comment sure. on, but I think it has been um, considered by experts. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. There are no further questions. Thank you. Councillors, it's five to seven, so um, we're compelled to start the meeting. So we will commence the meeting and um, see how far we go before we adjourn. So I welcome members of the gallery who are here to see their elected representatives operating as the governing body of their council. I acknowledge those in the community that are still experiencing the impacts of our recent natural disaster. Our council staff and community volunteers are on the ground and continue to support the community through the recovery and... I thank the community for their patience and for our council staff, community volunteers for their ongoing efforts. I'd like to remind those in the gallery as well as the councillors and staff that this meeting is being webcast, so please be mindful of what you say. Please turn off all mobile phones or turn to silent as they interfere with the sound system and make it hard to hear what is going on. To my fellow councillors, you know the oath that you took when you were elected, so I ask that you be true to that tonight. We have important decisions to make on behalf of our community, so please ensure your comments are respectful to each other and staff at all times. Again, I would like to acknowledge your traditional custodians of the land, the dark and young people on which we meet today, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Councillors, I note there are no apologies for the meeting this evening. But do we have any requests for leave of absences for any future meetings? Councillor Best. Yes, the next one, please. Which the I next, think you know is going to be the 16th, what is it? 23rd? 16th. Next meeting. Thanks. 23rd. Okay. Thank you, councillors. Do I have a mover? And a Councillor Gale. Do I have a second? A Councillor Sundstrom. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Unanimous. Thank you, councillors. Uh, councillors, I'd now like to move on to item 1.1, which is the disclosures of interest. Councillors, indicate if you have any disclosure of interest. Councillor Gale. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 3.3, um, Community Facilities Review. Uh, I'm 
declaring significant um, has been pecuniary throughout my time on in this chamber, though not at the, not presently. So I am um, taking precaution. I'm leaving the chamber with regards to previous board member at Coast Community Connections, new member at uh, Peninsula Leisure Centre and history with the Child Childcare Centre. So I'll be leaving the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hogan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I declare a pecuniary significant conflict of interest on item 3.3, community facilities review as I work out of a, a council facility. Therefore, I will leave the chamber if anything's discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marquette. Uh, thank you, Madam Med. I'll declare a significant um, pecuniary interest in regards to 8.1, which is noted to be in confidential, um, as I am the managing director of a company that um, employs local people and does work at times for the Central Coast Council at the local level. So I'll leave the chamber. You'll leave the chamber. Thank yes, you. Please. Councillor Vincent. Yep. Hello, Madam Med. I'm just trying to get uh, the right... Um... Shall I move on to the next one where you... Yes, thanks. Yeah, Councillor McLaughlin. Just a, a question on... Uh, the LEP and that. My understanding is that it's a, gen a generalised planning matters that go across the whole thing. Councils don't have to um, declare on that. Is that correct? Uh... Director of Governance, please. Through you, Madam Mayor. So there is a clause in the Code of Conduct that specifically says you do not need to declare pecuniary interest if the matter is a proposal re relating to the making of a principal environmental planning instrument, which I believe is what is under discussion tonight. On that basis, I won't declare. Thank you. Councillor Vincent. Um, thanks, Madam Mayor. So item 2.1, deferred item, public exhibition of the LEP uh, draft central case plan. In the um, public forum, I declared a procurement conflict of interest with the guest speaker, uh, as they believe they had the perception that I had a, a conflict of interest. Um, so on that item, with that particular item being discussed, I've declared that interest. However, can I clarify that that interest was only with that particular matter and uh, under the uh, local government uh, code of conduct which the central coast council code of conduct mirrors uh, councillors cannot have a conflict of interest in areas of the lep and just for clarification and for the public record um, with managing these conflicts in relation to the environmental planning instruments applying to the whole of the significant portions of council to prevent loss of meetings and special rules apply to the management of pecuniary interests. And in this area in particular, it deems that councillors can vote on areas that affect, that affect their houses, their relatives' houses, and also their employer or their business partner. So it's fairly clear under the local government code of conduct and the council code of conduct that it's imperative that councillors be able to form a decision and vote on this matter, on LEP matters. I'm, I'm not sure quite where to go with the particular item that the guest speaker has raised in the chamber. If I can reserve my right to maybe have that dealt with in, is the word in seriatim? In seriatim in future meetings. But what I will declare at the moment with the discussion tonight on, on item two point, sorry, I've lost the, 2.1 is that I, have a conflict of interest at the perception of a guest speaker that came to the chamber. However, I will be staying in the chamber and voting uh, on the item in the chamber tonight based on the code of conduct for the Central Coast Council, which is a mirror of the code of conduct for the New South Wales Local Government Act. Councillor McGregor. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. I'm not declaring a, a conflict of interest, but given the, the previous discussions, I just wanted to note that in the public forum that I declared an insignificant non-pecuniary conflict of interest because I knew one of the speakers um, through another organisation. It didn't prejudice anything to do there, but it's not relevant to item 2.1, but I just wanted to put that on the record in case anyone was wondering why I didn't declare it for this point. Thank you. Councillor Zorano, are the lights on? Therefore, I will... Do I have a mover for the motion that we receive the report on disclosure? Councillor McGregor, second. Councillor Hogan. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Unanimous, thank you. Councillor, I now move on to item 
that Council confirm the amended minutes of the ordinary meeting of Council held on February 24, 2020. So I note the amendments of the minutes were a correction to the title of item 2.2 in the disclosure of interest and a correction to councillors in the chamber for the procedural motion exception method. Do I have a mover for that motion? Councillor McGregor, second by Councillor Smith. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Unanimous apart from Councillor Gale. Thank you. Item, moving on to item 1.3, notice of intention to deal with matters in confidential session. I note that we have item 8.1, the local preference policy. Reason for considering closed session is uh, 2F matters affecting the security of the council, councillors, council staff or council property. Do I have a mover? Councillor Mertens, seconder. Councillor Smith. I now move the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. So Councillor Holstein, Councillor Smith, Councillor Vincent, Councillor Sudstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor Hogan, Councillor McGregor, Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Matthews, all those against. Councillor Best, Councillor Pillen, any abstentions? Councillor Greenaway, Councillor Marquette, I declare the motion carried. All bar Councillor Gale. Moving on, thank you. Councillors will now move on to the a procedural motion uh, to deal with the matters by exception. The exception method, as you know, is a process by which items are identified and then resolved as a group in accordance with the recommendation in the business paper. Councillors, I note we already have items identified by councillors for debate and they are as follows. So we will now go through the ones. Well, I'll start at the beginning so we're all on the same page. So um, item 1.4. Did somebody want to speak to it or do you? Right. Yep. McLaughlin. Yep. 1.4. Yep. 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 So item 2.1 is already up for speaking. Item 3.1, just checking the after hours still up. Um, 3.2, does anybody want to discuss that? No? Thank you. That'll go through. Um, the community facilities re review is up for speaking. 3.4, the presentation of the financial reports is up for speaking. 3.5, the election commitment updates is up for speaking. 3.6, the grant funding update is not at this stage. No lights on, okay, we'll go through with that. That's going through the exception. 3.7, the proposed sale of 357A Ocean Beach Road, Uminer, that is not starred. No, yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, 3.8 is up for speaking, which is the National General Assembly. 3.9, the herbal, um, uh, sorry, urban spatial plan is up for speaking. Uh, 4.1 is not the meeting of the record. 4.2 and 4.3 and 4.4 are not up for speaking. Is that correct? That's correct, thank you. Um, and then we have all the notice of motions are up for speaking. We have the rescission motion up for speaking and, of course, the local preference policy in confidential up for speaking. Oh. Okay. Oh. Yeah, we're still starring it. Yep. So she, she wants it, may have a question just over the break and then she may remove the star when we go into it. No, it's not at this stage. It's out of the bucket. Okay. Yes, Councillor Best, sorry. Thank you, save some time. 6.1, um, the Aero Club has approached me asking if I would withdraw it as they, uh, uh, I would withdraw 6.1. The Aero Club's asked me as they're uh, making some further investigations that my have better bearing and I'll bring it back later. But at the moment I'll withdraw So you're it. now withdrawing it's item withdrawing 6.1? It. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Best. Uh, sorry, Madam Mayor, can I just clarify? Is um, Councillor Best withdrawing it from Starry or withdrawing it from the agenda? From the agenda. Okay. 
Hi, counselors. Yeah, that's okay. We got that. It's still start. Thank you. Yep. Okay, councillors. Do I have a mover? Councillor McGregor, second councillor go. All those in favour? Uh, councillor Greenaway, are you up or down? And Councillor Marquette, are you up or down? Please. Thank you. Unanimous. Thank you, councillor. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. We're now going to have an adjournment for 30 minutes. Thank you.
Yeah? Thank you. Okay, the first item is the Mayoral Minute 1.4. And I note, Councillor McLaughlin, would you? Um, thank you. I rise to speak to it. If, Sorry, if, one sec. It's move. It's a mayoral minute, so I've moved it. But Councillor McLaughlin wants to speak. I'll second it. Doesn't need to be second, does it? No. No. Okay. I just wanted to amend it. So should I do that first? No, just Councillor McLaughlin. Speak. Okay. Thanks very much for allowing me to speak to it. it um, and I, you know, I, I congratulate you for having a. Uh, a, a look at the entrance channel again, and you know I understand the politics behind it. I understand the, the reasons behind it, and I, and, but I do think it's good to mention Chris Spence and what he did for the entrance. He was one; he was the only politician I know in the last couple of decades that actually had a crack at trying to get something for the entrance channel. We got the Cardinal report out of it, uh, which recommended the break walls. And w what I did oppose the other night was the actual rehashing of that because the Cardinal reports talks about 50 to 80 million dollars and yet I had a meeting with a coastal engineer this week at uh, and I'll bring I'll bring him to the council at some stage but he, he talked about different ideas and, and what we could actually do to get a permanent solution there to keep the channel open and one of it was fluidization and that just required putting a pipe in the in the sand burying the pipe in the sand and blowing air and water through it which loosens the sand up and the low tide scours it out he, his estimation quickly off the, off the back of his head was that we could get a permanent solution for the entrance channel between one and two million dollars. So I commend you for trying to chase the money, 50 million dollars from the state government. And I understand the, 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 the politics behind that. But the, the motion that you voted down that last week would have looked at different options than that. We may not have to spend 50 million dollars. There, there may be a solution for the entrance channel that's quite cost effective for the community. And, that in, in, and as I said before, I'll bring to the I'll bring these ideas to council. In in uh, is what the coastal engineer said, but he said he could think he could, he could fix the entrance channel between one and two million dollars. But I commend you I commend you for uh, trying to get money for the council. Good on you. What's your amendment, um, Madam Mayor? I just balked at the expression um, permanent solution for the entrance channel, and then I had a look at the. Um, media and it was it just seemed to be what would the residents like without there being any um, studies or anything behind it so I just thought rather than just say what would you like um, I thought we could instead of saying a permanent solution maybe change it to a longer term solution because I don't think we're ever going to get anything permanent and um, after the entrance channel insert that is consistent with the state government expert panel because there's an expert panel that's been set up and I just wouldn't like there to be all this money being allocated to something that the expert panel would um, not support. That's a lot of money to throw at something that isn't actually going to solve the problem. It's really important that it's solved. It was in a longer term permanent solution? No, not permanent, just longer term because I don't know. I think know the community was pretty clear they wanted a permanent solution and that's what's been said in, you know, back in 2013. Yes, except that the permanent solutions there, there's five options and it may be that the, the better option isn't one of those five. So I just think referring think, it always back to the media. We're not stipulating what the solution is. We're just saying a permanent solution. I don't yeah, I know. It's, it's just that you're referring to the media. So I just thought if people look at the media, they'll see what the five options were. So, or maybe not limited to the solutions think, offered or proposed. I mean, <laughs> so a solution, um, but in brackets, but not limited to those proposed by I, the... I don't believe this motion limits to anything that's in the media. I think the motion is saying a permanent solution, whatever that permanent solution may be, because in the previous motion that we did put up, it says looking for a long-term um, permanent solution. I don't think it's just limited to what's already. No, perhaps not, but just because it's the attachment, I just thought a little bit of clarity. Uh, well, the attachment's just there so that people understood that that's where it started back in 2013 and that was where the figure kind of came from. But then they'll say, well, the context was we used the media as the, 
as the basis for the decision. So I just thought, just for clarity, um, just put um, not limited to those solutions proposed by the media article, the 2013 media article, just so that it's clear that we're not just... I'm happy for permanent, yep, but you can put that in, not limited to those solutions. In the media article of 26 November 2013. Yeah, okay, I'm happy for that, but I still want the word permanent. Twenty-six. Oh, do you want the date, or are you happy Attached, with that? Which is November twenty six, two thousand thirteen. And then, um, and that is consistent with the state government expert panel. Really, what this motion is doing, Council Greenway, is really just trying to secure some money around that. Um, I'm not convinced that it has to have has anything to do with the panel. It's about getting some allocated money into a budget. And this is in the state expert okay, panel. Okay, we'll see if anyone the panel that supports that. Hasn't even been formed. I'd hate to think oh, that I the panel. It had. Sorry, hasn't, hasn't it been? I thought the the people were announced on the panel. Is that not right? Who would know that? No, no? I'd hate to think that we have to now wait because okay. of the panel. Okay, well, don't worry about that last bit, but. Oh, okay. So, do you is it expert? Has it been? No, there's no expert panel. Um, well, no, you can because. Um, you're happy to... Madam Mayor, in terms of the expert panel, my understanding is that the individuals have been identified, and um, and I get this from the Coast and Catchments Committee that met, I think, a week and a half ago, um, that the individuals have been identified, and the list is currently with the minister for announcing. Um, certainly the information provided at that committee, and I think the presentations are available for all councillors, um, highlighted that um, I know you, you've got permanent solution there, and as Councillor Greenway indicated, it's referring to that media article that is about training walls, and certainly um, that has been considered as an option over time. Uh, the presentations and information um, I think does need to go before the expert panel for a recommendation. When you look at those Cardno reports and you look at the rating of all of the options, um, that does not come up highly in virtually any of the parameters. Um, so certainly it can be in the mix for consideration, um, but I think we, it's really important that we don't in any way lock that in as a permanent solution. Um, so I'm happy to support the amendment. Um, yeah. Just leave it in there. Still, as I said, this motion really is just about trying to get some money secured. It's, I don't believe that it's necessarily about what was attached. The attachment is just saying that back in 2013, that figure, figure was bandied around for a permanent solution. I think yeah. we have a motion on the books that already does state that we need a permanent solution, whatever that permanent solution will be. But I'm happy to leave it there if that makes people more comfortable. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Sundstrom. Uh, just a question, if I may, Madam Mayor. I think that, um, forgive me, I don't have the date or which meeting it was, but I think we've already passed motions that have um, given a commitment to working with the expert panel. So I, I understand your hesitance in trying to uh, wrap it up in, th in this um, amendment, and um, I appreciate the fact that you've, you've, um, we're willing it at first to accept um, not limited to those solutions, but yeah, we've already we've already made a commitment to work with you know, the expert panel. Councillors, there are no further lights on. Oh. Councillor Best. Um, could I just ask, <coughs> would, um, would you consider in three asking the same question of or a similar pledge from the opposition leader? Sure. Would that be all right? <coughs> okay. Yeah, I just said sure. I'll, I'll accept. Word who's, it up. who's got the motion? You, you, you and it's Bruce. Mine. You and Bruce. Oh, sorry, you've got it. Um, look, I understand. I think I understand what you're trying to achieve here, and, and, I, and I actually agree with you. Fine, it's it's good to do, but it's kind of going to happen in this room and we know 
the way these things work. We've been here long enough. We've done 12 or 15 years and others have done some years and I've done a few. So we know how this will play out. When you just ask an ambit claim for 50 million, that's nice, but the reality is, is that it's really not going to help the people that are looking up to us or, or to us to, um, to try and help the problem and avoid what we just went through. It'll kind of help a few people, I suppose, you know, push a few political barriers at each other. But frankly, at the end of the day, I, I don't see anybody coming up here with a checkbook giving us 50 mil without a, a serious plan about how we're going to spend it. You know how it works. I mean, the amount of effort that had to go into the original Tugger Lakes, you know, um, management plan, um, Tugger Lakes um, restoration plan, that was years. And we had to have so much documentation to get 20 million out of them. And then it came at an election. So there's no elections for a little while, I suppose. Uh, maybe this room's going to have one, but there's no state elections um, for a while. And we know these amounts of money tend to appear during elections, and there's no cynicism in that. It's just a fact of it. So what I would like to think, and I won't be moving it tonight, but the community is desperately looking to us to lead on this issue and not pass the parcel. We don't care what side of the tracks you come from, and you know, you want to throw Bruce and I under a bus for inciting the community. We did incite the community. The community came here, 150 people, 200 people at Gosford, and said, enough, we want you guys to do something. So I would like to think that we're doing our budget right now, and that somebody in this room, Madam Mayor, just might take some leadership and say, look, we've got, we've got $792 million budget. Surely we can find a way to put some funds, serious funds, on the table right now we could do it tonight, but we'll do it at the next round when we do the budget discussions and say, OK, where can we get 10 million out of 792 million to actually get serious in the channel about doing a whole range of issues? Then we take ownership, which we should, and then we partner the state government, whether it be opposition or whether it be government. But the public are watching, and if they see us put a budget line item in the, of that, then I think they might respect us a bit more. We're not just passing it off to someone else, and I'm not being nasty to you, I don't think that's exactly what you're up to or wanting to do here. If we can get 50 million, that's fantastic. Great ask. But let's show some action on doing it ourselves here as well. And look, I've been critical of the budget going forward. It's currently the draft looks at about a 30, 32 million dollar loss. But we have got, and I've already talked to directors, we have got capacity in our borrowing, clear capacity in our borrowing ratio to take these funds on and get some action happening in that channel. And we don't have to push up our current loss, which is $61 million. We don't have to go for a $71 billion loss. We need to be a little cleverer and work with these guys and understand that they can help us with, with debt ratios and how we can do this. So there is a way forward for this, Madam Mayor, your way and also us taking ownership in the budget. I, I won't move it, I just flag it, okay? Councillor Smith. Uh, sorry, Madam Mayor, just a question through you to Councillor Best. I'm just recalling his previous motion about equitable distribution. So $10 million in the budget for the entrance ward uh, would mean not a lot else was happening in the entrance ward. Is that what he was planning? You see, Madam Mayor, there's been a series of those kinds... There's been a series of those kinds of questions to the speakers, to other councillors, even to yourself from Councillor Smith. She obviously covets your chair still, wants to lead the herd, but, but her questions are negative, her questions are not helpful, and they're really not taking us anywhere except into each other and not progressing anything. That issue that's just been raised is another red herring around where we go with this. We have got 5,150 people that had flooded a fortnight ago, and we're getting questions like, my ward's getting more than your ward. Sorry, yeah. Is there a point yeah, of order? Councilor, no, there's not a point sorry. of order. I'm not, no, don't interrupt well, me. There's well, actually, no I was going to ask, can you just answer the question? So, so the situation is, is there's got to be ward equitability, but there are regional matters of ser serious regional significance. And there are around 50,000 people that are... Thank you, Councillor Best. Councillors, there are no further lights. I will therefore 
put the mural up as moved by myself. All those in favour of the mural minute, please raise your hand. Unanimous. Unanimous. Thank you, councillors. Sorry, you want division. Get on your feet. Haven't you got someone? Um, councillors, move on to item 2.1 which is the deferred item for outcomes of public exhibition of the draft Central Coast Local Environmental Plan and draft Central Coast Development Control Plan. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank Madam Mayor, I do have an alternate motion that I did send through the staff, um, and I believe that's up on the screen. Um, I might just explain it if I could before I get a seconder. Um, so, in essence, councillors, it does support some of the recommendations from the staff in terms of uh, changes to the, to the LEP and DCP, but importantly, it defers finalisation um, of the LEP and DCP <coughs> until after the local strategic planning statement has been completed and submitted, and that would mean that the draft Central Coast LEP and DCP would then be reviewed um, just to make sure they align with what has been um, finalised in the local strategic planning statement. Um, so if I can just draw your attention to parts of it. I actually, I might just check if I've got a second before I talk too much more. Uh, Councillor Sons. Oh. Thank you. Councillor um, So I might just go Sunstrom. through it if I could. So part A is as per the staff. Part B is different, so part B relates to the concern in the former Gosford LGA about the R2 zone and the minimum lot size. Um, so um, as we know from uh, a response to a question on notice, there are over 30 councils that allow more than one minimum lot size in the residential zone. So this would um, continue the 550 square metres as the minimum lot size for the R2 zone. Um, part C, um, replaces a clause and the reason that that has been, and you better put the clock on me I think, <laughs> um, the reason that has been moved across is because of the new, um, what will be heading our way in terms of low rise medium density code um, that allows a whole lot of things like, and the staff can correct me, I'll get this wrong, but secondary dwellings and a whole lot of other things like that. Um, but it does refer to the minimum lot size in our LEP. And there are some zones that are relevant that we were looking at taking out the minimum lot size, which means it would default um, to the code, which would not be as good an outcome. Um, part D is as per the staff. Part E, if you go keep going through, all the rest of those parts are as per the staff recommendation. Um, if we go down to stop there, part Q is different, so it refers to the setbacks um, for uh, the zones in the former Gosford and it requests that they be continued in the DCP, the Central Coast DCP. Um, and then the remaining parts really talk about um, the local strategic planning process, that we need to go out with our community, we need to um, develop character statements for the former Wyong, the existing Gosford or the former Gosford. Um, it also looks at the permitted uses in the zones and the, I want to thank the staff for providing a very detailed document that was um, the draft LEP and the, a matrix of the permitted uses in the different zones and the changes. Um, some of those are of concern and so this motion would request that we consider those proposed changes in uses as we look at our wards and the local strategic planning statement. The idea is that after we adopt the LSPS that we uh, would have a further report come back that would also talk about what changes might be necessary to align with the LSPS. Um, and the last one is that requesting the Mayor um, seek a meeting with relevant staff from the Department of Planning, interested councillors, the CEO and our planning staff to really look at the strategic planning framework. One of the challenges with all of this is that we have got so much happening at the one time. Uh, we've got the local strategic planning statement and really that should have been first. We shouldn't be trying to do it after we're looking at a consolidated LEP or DCP. Um, my understanding is that we're doing a rural land study at the moment, I think, um, and a housing strategy. I'm sort of just looking for some acknowledgement that that 
is correct. Um, and if those things are happening, it seems that we've got it back to front to be putting through changes to the consolidated and draft um, and DCP before we know what the outcomes of those studies are. I understand that this is probably quite frustrating for the staff and I apologise for that. I know you're very keen to see this progress. Um, I can assure you that it's frustrating for me as well um, that we're still looking at this um, and I uh, would request your patience as we work with our community to try and get the best outcome for the Central Coast. Thank you, councillors. Councillor Sundstrom is seconded. Did you want to speak? Just briefly, I will. Yeah. <coughs> Look, I rise to support this uh, motion um, for the fact that we need to continue to engage with our community. This community has been very interested and it's one of the um, items that have gone out on exhibition that's received the highest level of uh, interest from the community. So I've, I've always said that uh, you can't have a, a great council without that great community right there beside us. So this allows that engagement with the community to continue. Um, I support the, the concept of uh, wrapping up the local planning strategic, uh, the LSPS, um, before getting the LEP nailed down, because I think that um, you know, one feeds into the other, and with the information that we will be able to use as a guide for the LEP, that LSPS will um, be invaluable. Um, finally, I'll just refer to the point six that Councillor Smith has um, included. And I'll note that it calls for interested councillors uh, to be involved in a, a meeting with um, state planning and the mayor and staff. And I just hope that usually when a, a motion contains the phrase inter interested councillors, you can tell exactly who those people are going to be. So I'd encourage those councillors that don't identify time and time again as being an interested councillor to get involved in this process and um, work together as a, a you know, unified body, which this council should be doing. I commend the motion. Councillor McGregor. Uh, question through you, Madam Mayor, to Director Scott Cox. A lot of talk about the, um, the LSPS and its relationship to the LEP, be that you know, draft form, whatever. Could you just provide some information on your understanding of the hierarchy of planning controls and how these documents interrelate with one another, please? Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor McGregor, uh, my understanding is that the local um, strategic planning statements are high level aspirations for the community, which is derived from the community strategic plan. Um, in the hierarchy of scheme, uh, we see it as uh, being in line with the consolidated LEP, both are vehicles to take um, the, the planning process forward to the comprehensive LEP. So they work in unison. One is to consolidate some of the, uh, the controls across the coast, um, looking at what is the most reasonable um, without having a significant impact um, across the central coast. Um, whereas the local um, strategic planning statements are based on those high level actions that council can work to when it's forming new policies and, and, and the information from its uh, strategies and studies going forward to develop a, a new comprehensive strategic plan, uh, comprehensive LEP, which would then take the council forward over the next 20 years. Thank you. Just one further question. Um, in regards to the comprehensive LEP, do we have any information on the um, the timeline both in development and potential delivery? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, um, Councillor McGregor, I see that as a three to five year time frame, probably closer to the five year. And are there any time constraints on deferring the uh, consolidated LEP? Does it have to be de um, determined by a certain time? Um, through you, um, Madam Mayor, the, the only time constraint that I'm aware of is the gateway. The gateway expires in June, July this year. Okay, no further questions, thank you. Councillor Greenaway. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've just sent um, two amendments through to Councillor um, Meeting Support. 
Sorry, it's one amendment with two sections. Do you have that up there? Can you put it up on the screen? So are you asking the mover to make an amendment or are you going to make... No, can, are you able to put it up on the screen? So are you moving an amendment? Yes. Or yes. Addendum. So you're... Oh, well, sorry. Stand corrected. Um, we have some very um, concerned residents in two particular parts of Wyong Ward at the moment and they have been approaching us for some length of time in regard to two matters and one is the amalgamation provisions in Orchard Road, Kangiangi and the other is rezoning the southern section of Wairima Road, Warnervale back to R2 as it's currently R1. Now they have been um, given information that is conflicting with other information they've been giving, given and for some months, some years actually, and I think in the case of the Kangi, Kangiangi people it's almost decades, um, they've really been seeking a resolution to these issues. So I've been told various things by planning professionals and sometimes it's not the best news for the residents but I just thought I really would like the staff to just provide some specific advice, written advice, on removing the amalgamation provisions in respect to Orchard Road, Kangiangi and rezoning the southern section of Wairima Road and whether, I should probably add, and whether these things can be achieved in the current um, LEP. Councillor Greenway, so just so we're clear, you want to just, this is just it, this is your addendum. So you don't want to add it to Councillor Smith? No, I do. That's why I was saying it was amendment, but someone said well, no. Well, you can just have that, you can ask Councillor Smith, would she add it to her motion? Well, that's what I was wanting to do, but someone called out that it was something else and okay. I said... So, Councillor Smith, will you accept those two... I'll just put your microphone back on, sorry. Uh, Would you accept those to your amendment? Um, Councillor Greenaway, I, I won't accept those on the floor. There is a part of my motion that um, requires staff to provide a briefing on the submissions and I personally think it would be more appropriate to have that conversation as part of those briefings part of that briefing, including the speaker tonight, just to get some clarification around the issues surrounding it. Um, you know, I, like th those two statements there are significant planning matters that you can't do on the floor without the background information behind it, uh, in um, my I view. I think they've been, I mean, the residents have told me that they've been corresponding with staff for a very long time. In fact, um, through you, Madam Mayor, if um, I could ask a question of Mr Cox. Are you familiar with both of those matters? Um, through you, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of uh, the amalgamation provisions uh, for Orchard Road. Um, I've, I'm a, in terms of B, I'm aware that there's been some um, concerns raised by the community at Wairima Road in terms of the current zoning up there. But I might just add that um, by adopting a spot rezoning on the floor of council without any, without having to go out to the community with um, uh, through exhibition or community consultation, may add some legal risk in terms of what's adopted um, uh, I'm not going actually forward. Seeking to adopt a spot rezoning, I'm just asking for advice because the the community is being told some things. Oh, you should do it this way. You should do it that way. Um, so I'm not actually asking for a spot rezoning, I'm just asking for advice as to whether um, the, this process is the right process for achieving the things that they're wanting because they're being told it is and then they're being told it's not. So yeah. I just... I, through you, Madam Mayor, I agree. It's, it's, it's not, the consolidate is not the right process for the um, zone conversions, um, for, for, for the rezonings of sites and we made that clear from the start, apart from the conversion of the environmental zones as part of the IDO, um, which has been recommended to be deferred. Okay, so is it not possible that, that what you've just said, but elaborated on a little bit more, um, be put in writing? Because these people have been frustrated for a very long time and it just we really just feel that we need to get back to them with some concrete information. 
So I'm not asking that it be a spot rezoning, I'm just asking that it, it be addressed so they understand why it is, because it looks like, you know, we're being sympathetic but we're not getting it done, but we need to actually say... Councillor Smith. Um, Councillor Greenaway, um, I've noticed that your amendment does just require specific advice. Um, can I just, um, if I incorporate it into the part that actually requires council or requests that staff provide a briefing on the submissions made, including specific advice on those two matters, um, okay, if we could do I'm that, that, that yep. would address that concern. Um, Okay, so you're accepting that into us. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Holstein. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think um, Councillor Smith has addressed some of those, but not limited to, because there's several others that yeah. I think need to be looked into, uh, discussed beyond those as well, and would look forward to that briefing sessions where I hope all the councillors would attend to go through those. There was one other issue. And I do need to preface my statements with this is not a moral issue. This is about an issue of making sure you're putting the right things in the right places. Uh, the issue comes back to the fact of that um, within the current LEP, and I'll ask Mr Cox for clarification here, under current LEP, home occupation will also include sex services. I say that, but we talk about brothels. And we talk about that because I went through a period of time in Gosford where Gosford took some drastic steps for not opposing brothels, but ensuring that their locations weren't next to primary schools, weren't next to schools. And that's why adjustments were made to ensure that they were placed within industrial zones, appropriate um, business parks and so forth, just to ensure uh, locations. I know Wong did something similar, Sorry. but Mr Cox, can you tell me within the Central Coast um, <coughs> Uh, LEP, whether that's been addressed or whether it's sought to uh, be changed, and were there differences between Gosford and Wyong's initial um, constraints in regard to that? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Holstein, for, for um, raising this matter with me too. Um, it came to my attention uh, just recently as well. Um, the former Wyong Council had uh, enabled home occupation sex workers in, in, in R1 zones, uh, business zones, uh, and a number of rural zones. Um, the, the consolidated LEP was going to introduce them into the, um, in, in, into the former Gosford area as well. I, I have some concerns with that, um, and I've actually drafted up a, uh, a, 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 an additional um, I suppose, recommendation uh, for councillors to consider. Um, my intention, I, I actually think that perhaps they should be rolled back in the former Wyong council area as well too, but, but the fact that they've already been exhibited may, may put the council at some risk if you took away some expectations through there. But through uh, a, a further um, work in the comprehensive or um, a, another planning proposal. I think there can be some adjustments made with that. I don't really have an issue with, say, an E4 zone um, because it's only the, the resident that can, can work as a sex worker. You have to actually uh, live on the property um, or rural zones um, or even in, in industrial zones where, where it may allow so, someone to be able to live. I don't have an issue with them, but I think it's a bit of a stretch to t allow it in the R1 zones and the neighbourhood zones. And uh, I, I think that um, my recommendation to councillors would be to defer it, that component from the, uh, from, from the former Gosford and look at uh, perhaps rolling it back in the former Wyong component. So, Mr Cox, um, with the motion that has been touted or whatever motion goes up this evening, what would be your suggestion, sir, to have that addressed so it's not lost within what's currently being touted? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, um, my recommended uh, 
my recommended recommendation would be um, that council introduce an additional provision in the draft in the Central Coast LEP, which does not alter the permissibility of occupation home occupation sex services from the current Wyong LEP 2013 and the Gosford LEP 2014 within the land that they currently apply. By meaning uh, the meaning of that, the intention is that they would still apply to the to the uh, land use zones in the former Wyong, however, um, that the prohibition would still apply in the land use zones for the former Gosford. So through you, Madam Mayor, I'll just ask whether those words of Mr Cox could be incorporated by the mover of the motion? There's no site inspection. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> no site inspection. Councillor Best wants a site inspection. <laughs> no. I just asked, is there one? Uh, do, Mr Cox, are you giving staff those words? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Best, whilst we're getting the words, would you like to um, yeah. uh, get your oh, three minutes? I'll doing that because my question was going over to him. Um, or maybe Gary. Hi, Gary. Hi, Mr Murphy. I'll have Councillor Sumstrom up in a minute, contributing yet again. Um, Mr Murphy, um, when, when did you get to see this resolution? Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Best, I haven't seen it until it went up on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr Cox is a bit busy, so I kind of want to go that way, if I may, Lisa. Madam Mayor, Lisa. Yeah, it's got to go that way. Councillor Hogan, do you have a... Would you like to continue? Yeah. Your light was on. I've got an amendment. Early night. Are you finished? Has okay. Councillor Best finished? Pardon? So oh. you've got an amendment... You want to ask the mover to add something or you want yes, to totally new... Yes, I'd like to ask the Mayor, the Deputy mover. Mayor Jane, if I could make an amendment. No, you want to add to her amendment. I want to add something to her. She'll reject it, that's all right. I think staff have got it up. I think they're probably doing... Sure. It's in relation to the, the YCOB property. Rezone lots 2 to 7 DP 249281 and lot 11 DP 5985802 RU2 oh, two, two, Rural Landscape. CCLEP instrument amendments, additional permitted use to be included in Schedule 1 of CCLEP and shown on the additional permitted use map layer to permit the following land uses on lot 2 to 7DP 249281 and lot 11DP 598580, cabin parks, cemeteries, education, facilities, electricity, generating works, hospitals, markets, places of public worship, pubs, restaurants, sewage system signage, tourists and visitor accommodation. I think you, as you've heard from the speaker tonight, that her situation is quite unique and has been trying to... Um, Sorry, Councillor Hogan. Um, what's your point of order, Councillor Vincent? This was the item I declared a conflict, a perceived conflict by the speaker on earlier, okay. and I chose to leave the chamber. <laughs> Can this be dealt with as a separate item um, in, and voted on in seriatim, if that's the right word? I'll just have to concur. Sorry, I'm not sure. Has yep. anybody got a question on that? This is anybody? in connection with the guest speaker that came in that had the perceived. Madam Mayor, just to shortcut this, I just checked with Councillor Hogan when we were together. We could just include that one for the briefing rather than trying to make a decision on the floor tonight. Um, and Councillor Hogan has accepted that. So that might remove the conflict of interest issue. If it's up there as a motion, as part of that, I'll be leaving the chamber. So. Sorry, um, Director Cox has just want to add some to that. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, through you, councillors, depending on which council resolution gets through tonight, I'm happy for that to be included as a, as a, as a, as a, a workshop for the councils on that side. But I, I do need to just add some points of information which I think uh, are important to that matter that was um, that the speaker raised tonight. That um, yes, the, um, the the matter the the site did not get rezone to a rural zoning as part of Wyong LEP. The council laws and the Department of Planning, planning um, enabled the site to be zoned E3. Um, and one of the one of the, the, the reasons, that, there were many, there was the fact that there, there are no RU zones in that vicinity in the context of the site. But, but where I'm getting to, there was a council resolution of the former Wyong before, um, before uh, amalgamation um, uh, yeah, before amalgamation commenced, uh, and that resolution of the former Wyong Council was that the matter be reviewed um, by the council. That review was put to the, the administrator um, during administration uh, about that property, so that council resolution was enacted in terms of a further report going up to council. Um, it's always been the advice to the owner of the site that it could be dealt with either as a, um, you know, a, a planning proposal put forward, putting putting any supporting information that the council may not be aware of, or alternatively, it would be something that council staff were going to look at as part of the environmental lands review as well. Councillors, so. That's now going into your. Um, I think it's point number four. Um, hopefully, if we can get, not the um, current wording, but just that it be included as one of the briefings or part of that briefing, um, a bit more detail around that particular matter. Thank you, uh, Councillor Best. Do you have a question? Um, Mr. Cox, Scott. Mr. Cox. Um, when did you get to see? the original resolution that was put up tonight? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, I saw a, a, a brief, I think Councillor Holstein gave me a, a sighting for a couple of minutes in the, uh, after the, the briefings and I think about 10 minutes ago I got a copy off the uh, Madam Mayor and then I've just seen an email come through then, so that's what I've seen. I, I suppose, like you've been here for quite a while and myself and we've been through a lot of these kinds of discussions over the years. And whilst I, I, the sentiment of what's being put forward, I understand it and it's a very complex issue that we're dealing with, but this is somewhat ad hoc, the way I see it going, Mr Cox. So if we were to support this, um, are we crafting zoning policy on the run here? And, and, and from what you can see on there, are there any material dangers that we're going to cause ourselves if we resolve this way this evening? And I have a supplementary question to that, if you think it through. And I know you haven't had a lot of time, and I've had no time whatsoever, and I'm going to vote on a document that's going to affect thousands and thousands of people, and I haven't even seen it yet. And we did this with the pile burn and we got 5,165 people pretty upset at nine o'clock at night we did that, if you recall. Same thing, guys. So, Mr Cox, is there any material in here that we're going to really damage, break, set back, upset, do, or are we just deferring and going to deal with the key issues that have been raised? Can you just um, take th a minute? Th through you, Madam Mayor, I think Councillor um, Best, uh, uh, I can't give a, just a general broad statement about the the, the resolution itself. I'd, I'd have to be asked on particular matters, um, point by point. Um, I mean, I, I can go through and, and discuss um, and, and provide some input into to some of the points raised well, in terms of the minimum well, hang lot on, size. Scott, can I try um, this to save you going through the whole thing? In what we're going to do here, are we going to legislate into law? actions that will change and inf influence and impact, or is this all coming down to a briefing, a discussion, more reports, and then back into the chamber? So there's lots of filters on this, or are we actually gonna legislate here? 
Um, through you, Madam Mayor, I think the intention is for further briefings um, from, if I read point four correctly, is that the staff provide a briefing on some of the submissions made. Um, I suppose my, my only concern is that I'm happy to give councillors a briefing on those matters, but um, just from looking at them, they, they appear to be different to the key principles that staff set up when they first developed the, um, the um, um, uh, consolidated LEP, and that was that there was going to be a general base, no zoning changes unless it was going to be a conversion of environmental mm. lands in the form of Gosford. There wasn't going to be any up zoning, down zoning, um, unless there was an error in a previous planning instrument or process that went forward. Um, that would be my concern with that. But at the end of the day, council's entitled to to, to um, support any any zoning they think are reasonable. Um, but, but for we're the not really legislating here, are we? Not tonight. I don't think no, so. That, no, that, that's more talking up there. So if I can ask you, um, we're we're kind of picking winners and losers here a bit by adding in different people from the you know the lectern and what have you. And there's a lot of other people that didn't get to the lectern tonight. There's people from the Munmora community that are in the gallery tonight. And I know that they have significant issues around how the LEP is crafted and, and going forward the impact it has on them. And I genuinely believe it's extraordinarily unfair what's going on in that region. They're not in here. So how do we put the fairness test over this when certain people get Guernseys to be up there and other people who couldn't be at the lectern tonight, we don't hear from them yet. They've got genuine issues with us. No, no different to the people that spoke. How do we get them into the room on this? Um, to, to, to give you an idea, Councillor Best, um, I'll refer to the staff here. How, how many of the 756 uh, submissions, I know that um, 300 were for um, some recreation area at Avoca, but how many of the submissions, um, not to the exact amount, but generally I thought it was around somewhere between 50 or 70 submissions that were seeking some form of spot rezoning or an upzoning? Can we go through those at a briefing? Um, if I have a resolution of council, I will brief councils on all those um, submissions we well, received. It might take a long time though. <clears throat> well, but we're putting a handful of people there that are going to be the focus of discussion and the other people are going to not be Considered, and that's his policy on the run tonight. I don't want winners and losers. I want everyone to play a fair field. And at the moment, I'm crafting winners and losers. So, what's it say, mate? It's for that staff provide a briefing and submissions made. Exhibition part there. Sorry, Council Best, why you um, consider what you're doing? Councillors, um, we've now. The 30 minutes has expired for this matter. Extension? So I'm call for an extension of time procedure. 10, 15, what do you want? Well, you tell five. me, councillors, I'm in your hands. Councillor Holstein. Oh, I'm happy to move for a five minute extension, Madam Mayor. Mm. Five minutes. All those in favour of five minutes extension, please raise your hand. Unanimous, thank you, councillors. Continue. Sorry, yes. Well, Councillor Greenaway, I've got the um, director out there having a conversation. It's not just as simple as that. Yeah, it's not that simple. Councillor Besk. Look, since what Mr Cox has just outlined, that we are not legislating tonight, um, there, there is in for the ability to inject into the discussion other genuine parties that want to have themselves looked at. Well, Chris pointed out earlier, and he amended it with Jane to um, to try and get and others on there. But since that's there, and the important part, Council Assumption, is I just need to qualify at this late hour um, that we weren't legislating up front, and that it was locking in certain things. It's it's all about what is being suggested from the floor, but it will come back through a secondary filter at the staff a briefing and then a report. And, and the reality of all this is that you most probably won't get to see this LEP in this term of council. You won't make the decision. It'll be the new council, most probably, not guaranteed, but I just know how this all pans out and plays out and you're in caretaker mode. So this council in its three years never really got its LEP up, um, which is a bit sad because 
you know, it, it is something that a council gets only a rare opportunity to get at. I mean, the, the 1993 LEP took to about 2,000 to get hold of, and here's one right in front of us all, and you didn't get to put your, your kind of um, imprimatur on. But anyway, um, it'll be what it is. So um, I, I, I think I can support that, that we're not legislating. Uh, that's my proviso on this. Council Vincent. Um, Madam Mayor, before this is put, I didn't get an answer to the question earlier about if this can be put, uh, done in, in seriatim. And if you need a procedural motion to do that, I'll move Well, that's that. right. We need a procedural motion after concurrence. I believe the uh, Director of Governance gave you an explanation of what we can do here. So if you're going to move a procedural... Councillor Best, I'm in Councillor Vincent's hands. So the procedural is only on the voting part of the um, of this this motion. So the the area where the guest speaker had the perception that I had a conflict of interest that would be dealt with separately, and the rest of the bulk of the motion would be dealt with in one lot. I'll move that way. I don't know how to put the words, but if um, the general chief executive officer or the director for governance could give me a hand with that, that'd be good. Can you please assist with some wording just so we get it right, please? Yeah, so if the team just brings up the number of the one that he's referring to, so doubts, and we can just say that council will deal with the following part of the motion via in seriatim and the rest of the motion separately. Thank you for that. We can fix the exact wording tomorrow, but the intent is that we just deal with what that one part that you've flagged, Councillor Vincent, separately, and we will do all the other parts of the motion together. I'll move that way. Do I have a second for that, Councillor McGregor? Thank you. All those in favour of separating it for the purpose of debate? So no, not all the hands? Right. It's just separate. Are you, yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, please raise your hand if you're in favour. All but councillor, it looks like all but councillor Marquette. Well Thank you. Well, I'm just trying to deal with conflict first. So now, right, thank you. Yep. Go ahead, Councillor Marquette. I'm just wondering, Madam Mayor, how, how it's feasibly possible that Councillor Vincent was out of the room for about 11 minutes. We've been flashing for it since the, the start, since we started speaking about it. How can a gentleman um, enter, enter the room Vincent and suddenly be in line? So Councillor Vincent flagged in seriatim, um, pulling things apart. I had a concurrence with the director. He left the room. I asked the director to go out there and have a conversation, and then we returned back to the matter of the original question. His light was on before your light. That's how I grabbed him back because I knew he did, was uncomfortable discussing that in the chamber because he, he has a conflict, a perceived conflict, so therefore he's asked, can we do that? So that's why I gave the liberty of getting that so we would split it. That matter's resolved. We can move on. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Right. So did you want to talk now? I'd, I'd love to, there Madam Mayor. Th thank you very much. I'd really appreciate that. Through you, Madam Mayor, I've got a question for, um, for Director Cox, if I could. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, Director Cox, can you just enlighten me? I, I believe I asked a similar question last time we spoke about this issue. How many instruments, planning instruments, are you trying to juggle at the moment, and why is that difficult? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, um, Councillor Marquette, we currently have five planning instruments. Um, and through this process, the recommendation we've put to council tonight is to uh, consolidate them to two. Um, so the bulk of the planning, uh, the, the um, planning controls would be would be in one uh, Central Coast LEP, um, and then the second, um, then we'll be deferring the IDO matters, uh, the environmental lands, which would then roll into our environmental lands review. Um, so within another twelve months, we would hope to be down to one. Mind yeah, you're out of the five minutes. So, well, I'm not sure if we're all the same. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the, the, the key difficulty is. is is, is apart from just having different controls from for, for, for wherever you live on the Central Coast, it, it's where the, the biggest inefficiencies in is in terms of our um, 
I suppose, council staffing um, in terms of it's preventing from, from co-location, um, having similar staff working out of one set of controls as of, as of two controls. Um, I suppose the, 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 the fact is that um, also that we, it's difficult to, 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 to give advice to different people as well using different controls, like having the efficiencies of staff in one. Um, it just working with one planning instrument is simpler than working with five. Sorry, right uh, reply. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I did, again, just want to acknowledge that I know this will be a frustrating process for the staff, and I do appreciate their work today. Um, but I do think that we need to get a better outcome than the one that we were heading for. Um, I note, and, and I really appreciate the matrix that was provided. It really demonstrated um, that not a lot changes for the former Wyong, a lot may change for the former Gosford, and that was highlighted when you look at the uh, permitted uses in the different zones, that a whole lot of things are gonna be permitted in zones in the former Gosford that were not previously permitted. Um, now, that may not matter in a lot of cases, but in some it will. Um, I also wanted to just address some of these submissions are talking about trying to use this process for a rezoning. At one point, I thought that was a good idea for some land up at Summersby, but I, I do acknowledge that a rezoning should really be put through as a planning proposal uh, because that requires that the various studies are done that need to be done to make sure that it's appropriate to rezone that land. Notwithstanding a couple of those that have history to them, that we need to be aware of that history. Um, but I would suspect that, um, in my view, it is unlikely that rezoning should be captured through this process. Um, uh, this has been a tortuous process. It has taken a long time. It may take a bit longer, and I understand that. Um, but in my view, um, and it, I, it just should not have been started under the administration. It should have been something that this council had carriage of from the word go, so that we made it very clear what the baseline was, what the principles were that we wanted to deliver through this. This council has not at any point endorsed the underlying principles that went with this process um, in terms of uh, the flexibility or which permitted uses would be um, included. So um, I'm hoping this gets up. I thank councillors in anticipation in the hope that it does. Um, and I hope that we can now work together and really work with our community to make sure that we get the best outcome. Thank you, councillors. These microphones. Um, we will now put the most of it, all but the last bit that we broke away, which is from um, Councillor Smith and Councillor McGregor. So it's the majority of it, all bar that one little section. Oh, sorry, Councillor Sundstrom, I'm wrong. Therefore, I'll, I will move all of the above. <laughs> you don't want me to read it all, surely. So all those in favour, please raise your hand. This is the first section. Councillor Best, Councillor Holstein, Councillor Smith, Councillor Vincent, Councillor Sundstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor Hogan, Councillor McGregor, Councillor Greenaway and Councillor Matthews. All those against? Councillor Gale, Councillor Pillen, Councillor Burke, Councillor Marquette, thank you. I declare the motion carried. Councillor Vincent, you're leaving the room. We now put the, mo the motion as moved by, I'm assuming it's, oh, it's gone. Sorry. Oh, I think it's right. Can you? I thought it was already up there. Okay, Councillor Smith, second by Councillor Sundstrom. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Councillor Best, Councillor Holstein, Councillor Smith, Councillor Sundstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor Hogan, Councillor McGregor, Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Matthews, Councillor Greenaway, all those against? Councillor Gale, Councillor Pillen, Councillor Burke, Councillor Marquette, I declare the motion carried. Thank you, councillors. Councillor Vincent can come back in. Can you just tell? Oh, there he is there. Thank you. Council, moving on to item 3.1, Council McGregor. 3.1. Yeah. I understand Council McGregor has an amendment. Council McGregor. 
Uh, I think it's option one. Model model one, sorry. So I'll, I'll move it with um, at the point one, say model one rather than model two. I already have the call, Councillor Best. Were you listening? That's not, that's just starring, that's not moving and seconding. So thank you. Yeah, pretty much. Thank you. Councillor McGregor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Look, we've been over this many times. We don't need to go over it again. We have quite a large business paper with lots of, of different um, things that are quite important that we need to get through. We've heard the arguments for and against the direct employment model. We now even have notices of motion supporting a direct employment model. So I'm glad we're going to see people applying the same consistency to the other matters tonight. I'm not going to rehash old arguments. I would implore you to go with model one rather than model two. And in the event that this is lost, then I'll be not voting in favour of Model 2 should that stand as the resolution. Councillor Mertens, did you want to speak to it? Yep. Sorry. Is that right? Okay, thank you. Can you tell them? That needs to, number one needs to go to Model, yep. Councillor Best. Well, we certainly have been uh, into this discussion before. There's no question around that, councillors. It's been about a year and a half, a bit longer, um, to Ms Lettingham and Ms Vaughan. Thank you for your patience and your contribution in delivering this. Um, and um, yes, it, it is a contract. And the nice part about it, like other contracts, which we'll get to tonight, it's gone out to tender. Um, the tender came back. Uh, the council said go to tender, so we did that. Uh, we all sat there and agreed with that, so it went out. The tender process is rigorous, time consuming and costly. It comes back. The council wakes up out of its slumber and says, I don't like that. That's contracting. Tear it up, Miss Vaughan. Julie, bad luck. Despite us knowing that one model, model two, is $350,000 and Model 1 is $1,350,000. So you are prepared to put $1 million on the line for something that the staff have passionately recommended and as you read in the report, there's about 10 councils identified there and one, Brisbane City, is the only one that runs its own internal service with, as Julie's report says, around 200 staff. It's an enormous council. And here we are, going to fly in the face of every other council having this service provided to them for a million dollars, an extra million dollars, Councillor McGregor. And you are pining and carping. The, the stuff that you have created in your motion come up tonight is just an outrage in my view, but we'll get to that as the night goes. So, councillors, you can take a million dollars and get these people to waste it for you, or you can get the million dollars, as I've said before in this room, you can employ six, maybe seven rangers, and they can go out and they can do a whole lot of things for that million dollars. That's a million dollars in wages we can actually spend on getting services done. The staff haven't made this stuff up. They've come along pleading with us for common sense. This has been kicked down the road for more than a year and a half. Now, I understand Councillor McGregor's position in life, you know, putting you know, neoliberals in his motions. I mean, who writes that stuff in a roads, rates and rubbish council? Point of order. What's the point of order? You don't like your own words? Point of order. Point of order is I've actually financially written on one thing understand. Like, he speaks to the motion, I'll buy the motion later on. Oh, he's the mayor now. So it's, I thought it was going to be senator, but it's mayor. Oh, right. OK, well, look, um, Councillor McGregor has got a view on life, and we understand that, and everyone's got a different view. But there can't possibly be 
a mixed view in this room to burn an extra $1 million of ratepayer money on a project that's currently running and is running well and has been running for quite some years and will continue to run for $350,000 versus $1.3 million. So if this goes forward, this is just another million dollars on the $61 million that you guys have burnt in the term of this council. Councillor Marquette. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, I also rise, and, and I hope all my colleagues will support Model 2. I think the staff have been... Um, the staff have really been over this uh, very thoroughly because I think this is the first time tonight that, um, that certain councils haven't stood up and said they're wrong. These figures are wrong. That's what we heard the first two or three times we spoke about this. So at least there's been um, some, some concept of reality that this isn't wrong. This is an extra million dollars a year to field, sorry, 6,300 calls. That's you know, 17 calls a day, something like that. It's, it's not a hell of a lot of calls. It's not bang for the buck of the rate payers. But again, I think like Councillor Best was trying to allude to, that's what socialism is. In the same night, we're going to have, let's get some revenue, doesn't matter where we get it from, but let's also waste another million dollars. A million dollars, three million dollars over three years, just torn up, over 6,300 calls a year that can be well fielded with what the staff came up with. It's not like we're not going to answer these calls as, a, as an organisation. The germane point to what people are trying to do here by take on Model 1 is, like Councillor Best alluded to, it's all about a difference of opinion it's all about socialism versus responsibility. Now, we, now no, one, no one in this room should have the ability to tear up a million dollars in ratepayers' money. That's not fair. We've done it over and over again. It's so frustrating. I feel like I've been bashed up in this room. I, as, you know, as a fiscal conservative, I feel like I want to jump off something high. Now, I can appreciate there's people here that enjoy that if I did. But what I'm trying to say is I'm a ratepayer as well. So are you guys. For God's sake, for God's sake, look inside yourself and for once, do something that makes an onus of sense. I'm not talking about your shirt either, Mr. Sundstrom. Um, let's do something that makes, that makes an onus of sense within this room. Let's do something for the ratepayers of the Central Coast and save them a million dollars for something staff had created, put out to tender, and should already be done. If we were running a business, you people would be broke so many times over, then the, the, the Centrelink office door would have hit you in the backside 15 times. It's embarrassing. Please, let's get back to letting these people do the operational works and we'll concentrate on roads, rates and rubbish. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Gale. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I rise to support the amendment. As the councillor put forward the request for staff to look into different options with regards to a call centre, can I say thank you to the staff that have put in that time and revealed the truth and come back with the figures? I don't think any of us can argue with three million over three years. I don't think any of us can argue with a cost difference of $213 versus 55 um, for, for in the difference in the two models. I, it, it flabbergasts me. I cannot understand, cannot fathom how anyone could vote for model one given the amount of services that we need to provide to these 350-odd thousand uh, residents that we have. I support model two and I'll be uh, supporting this particular amendment and I encourage my colleagues to do the same. Councillor Greenaway. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I will be supporting um, this motion, I think, strange as that may seem. Um, but I just wanted to record for the record that um, a lot of the, I guess, delay around this finally getting resolved, if indeed it is resolved, really comes from the fact that the average number of calls received after hours for this service is approximately 17 per night. And I think there was just a lot of um, goodwill, I guess, around trying to get those that volume of calls, which doesn't sound like many, um, answered by local people who could... Um, we could be supporting local jobs, trying to keep money locally, and instead we're going to be having it all farmed out, which is sort of the opposite to what a lot of us say. When it comes, when it comes to our residents, we're always saying we want employment, we want people to be able to stay on the coast. So that was why we were driven to look at a different model than outsourcing. So unfortunately, for whatever reason, the costs don't sort of justify doing that. But I just want it to be remembered that there was a lot of goodwill, and I even think at the very beginning that was why you suggested that the staff look at this. Um, because we did want to have the local people employed doing this, and 17 calls a night when people think, what, a million dollars a year? They, it's something that they find hard to fathom. 
So um, I will be supporting this motion very reluctantly. I had every hope that we could have found a better model. I mean, we've got a very large population. We've got a very large budget. Um, I understand that um, the Brisbane City Council is, one, is the only one out of the group that they looked at um, that does resource their own call centre. But I just thought, with all these other things we do, can't we tie it in with something? Can't we have the staff that do this have another role as well so it's not going to be so expensive? But in the end, it just looks like it's not going anywhere and we just need to firm up the relationship that we have with this current, in, um, current call centre. Um, and so, um, again, I just express my very great disappointment that we weren't able to do something for our local people. Councillors, there are no other lights on, so I'll give the amendment first, but I can give a right of reply first. Councillor McGregor, right of reply. It's interesting that we hear all this talk about roads, rate and rubbish, yet we're supposed to be in here being schooled on political economy. It's quite funny. I thought we'd have to wait till later. We can try and leave the personal attacks at the door for once and actually focus on the substantive matters. Or we can't, it's up to you. You determine your own behaviour, fellow councillors. We really understand as a group that there is quite a simple here. This is not an, a matter of ideology over information. This is a matter where if you ask yourself to look at this with a common sense lens and if you were a ratepayer and you saw how the former councils operated and you think, is it really going to cost a million dollars for someone to sit in a basement with a mobile phone? Ask yourself that. I have no problems with the arguments that I've raised over the course of this debate throughout. I haven't had to rehash them or try and do some political point scoring because that's not my style. I talk to substance. Now, we can vote on this tonight and we can get on with it. It will probably end up being model two, of course, as it seems that there is a clear majority. But I ask yourselves as the people watching this on the podcast and the people voting on this decision to at least apply some consistency because it seems like we have these huge problems with one area we have to have notices of motions about contracting out and all the associated illegalities of that we've heard from the former mayor from the operation that he used to oversee. And now all of a sudden we've got to support contracting out. So when you're watching this and when you're voting on this, ask yourself, are you being consistent? Are you applying the same rules of logic? Are you actually applying an intellectual interest in this or is it more politics? Let's see where we go. Thank you, councillors. I will now put the amendment as moved by Councillor Best and Councillor Marquette. All those in favour of the amendment, please raise your hand. Councillor Best, Councillor Holstein, Councillor Smith, Councillor Greenaway, Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Gale, Councillor Pill and Councillor Burke, Councillor Marquette. All those against? Councillor Vincent, Councillor Sunstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor Hogan, Councillor McGregor, Councillor Matthews. I declare the amendment carried. Therefore, sorry? Oh, I'm just now declaring the amendment now becomes a motion. All you don't want to write a play. All those in favour of the motion, which is model two, please raise your hand. Councillor Best, Councillor Holstein, Councillor Smith, Councillor Greenaway, Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Gale, Councillor Pillan, Councillor Burke, Councillor Marquette. All those against? Councillor Vincent, Councillor Sunstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor Hogan, Councillor McGregor, and Councillor Matthews. I declare the motion carried. Thank you. Beg your pardon? Sorry, 3.3. Uh, Councillor, I now move on to item 3.3, the Community Facilities Review. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just had a fairly relatively... We've got a couple that need to oh, leave. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, too uh, sorry, I'm all right to go? You're right now, thank you. Um, so there was just two minor changes to the recommendation. Um, so one is uh, part three. So the council right to all organisations directly affected by the policy, advising of the exhibition period and noting that staff are available to explain how the draft policy is relevant to their circumstances. And the last part, 
um, is actually just to acknowledge and thank the staff for their work in developing the draft strategy. So if I have a seconder, I'll just... A seconder for that. Councillor McGregor. Thank you. Um, so look, I did just want to acknowledge and thank the staff in particular for bringing the policy as it is. I know it's still a draft and there may be changes. Um, but I did want to just acknowledge that this was a really contentious issue leading up to, or well, even before the amalgamation, during the amalgamation and with our new council. It took quite a while to get it even on the floor for action and it's now been um, probably a year of developing this draft. Um, but I really did appreciate the efforts of our staff and the consultant um, that was involved. Um, it was... Um, it was such a fraught process that I, I really genuinely want to say how much I appreciated the staff took a view that they were listening. Um, they were listening to the community, they were listening to the councillors, and they actually wanted to know what the problems were and how we could solve them. Um, and I think that was um, incredibly value when the relationship with our community was fractured on this, and I think this process has gone a long way to rebuilding that trust and rebuilding that relationship and it's not without effort so I wanted to congratulate them and thank them. Um, I think it's a good draft policy. It might have things in the submission period that we need to change and there might be um, things that we've missed um, but I'm really pleased to support it going out on exhibition so thank you. Councillor McGregor. Thank you Madam Mayor. I too rise to support the, uh, the policy. I want to thank the staff as well from the same directorate as the people that prepared the previous report. You know, we can be cordial even if we don't have to agree on everything. This is quality work. This is an, a perfect example of the policies that we've talked about that have been formulated and consulted on correctly. This is something that's been a long and drawn out process and that's because there's significant complexities around the area and significant sensitivities for the community. Um, obviously, it's not going to be 100% perfect and it's not going to please everyone, but if we were going to look at an example of how this council can rebuild trust with the community after the disastrous reputations of the former councils because of their activities. This is a perfect example of it. This is the kind of best practice work that I hope to see continuing into the future. And I think it's extremely important that we note how this was done and that we do have big flagship key policies that they are done like this. So I would like to personally thank the director and everyone in the team, all the councillors and community members that have been involved in the stakeholder group and the like. I think this has been an extremely positive and constructive process and a clear shining example of how community and council can work to, together to deliver a better outcome for the community. It's about being consistent, it's about removing some of those inconsistencies that cause so much consternation with the former council's policies and I really think that over the long term, if we are to adopt this and implement it, that we will have a much stronger um, community trust with us, we, much get, we will get much better outcomes for the community. So, that, once again, thank you to the director. Please pass on your thanks to your lower level staff that we're not allowed to talk to, but they did a great job on this. The consultant, the people on the stakeholder group, this is an example of what we should be doing. And I thank you for your long-term interest and work on this to anyone who is involved. Councillor Greenaway. Just have a question, Madam Mayor. Um, we had some people from the, um, well, interested in the Central Coast Aviation Hub and the airport and all that sort of thing in today. And I did notice that the airport is on our website under community facilities, but they don't seem to, it doesn't seem to be in the review. Um, and I just thought, I know they have already have a deed of licence, but still, what category would they be in if the... If the Director Vaughan? Councillor Greenaway, I did actually respond to that question earlier today. Um, it, uh, you're correct in saying it's actually a deed of licence, so it's not currently covered within the um, current community facility. So the community facilities is quite specific in the types of um, groups that have been identified to fall within this policy. So the airport, although it may be shown on the website under community facilities, doesn't mean it ne necessarily falls within the realms of definitions for this policy. So this policy is more about um, halls, sporting clubs, um, uh, community centres. Um, so is the airport a community facility? They often refer to it as a Not for the purposes community. of this policy. So what's, it, what's its um, status then? What is it if it's not a community facility? Well, it's in the per for the purposes of it having a specific um, de a license, a deed 
of licence is my understanding. So I don't know, I'm not responsible for airports. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to comment as to how it's actually determined or, or identified, but it's not being captured under the, poli the community facilities policy. Are you, uh, oh, sorry, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, your, I did get your email and you suggested I ask the Director of Governance. Don't know whether you have anything further to add to that. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, it's correct. It's a de deed of licence. Mm -hmm. um, so I would suggest since this council has made previous resolutions about renegotiation of the deed, it will be up to you what aspects of this facility's review you think which policy principles may be relevant to any future deed negotiation. So for the purposes of the next, um, the, the um, negotiations around the next, we would look at the community facilities. That would be review. a matter for council to decide. Because if it's not included in it, then you would think they would just say, well, why would you look at the review, the, at the policy review, because it's not applicable to us. So I just wondered whether we need to include um, the airport as a community facility. I mean, that's, I mean, I didn't create the website. That's where it's been put. And that's what they constantly refer to it themselves sure. as. Yeah, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, there are a number of other um, groups that we will continue to review their tenure and their um, arrangement with council. So groups that were excluded were some of the council operated facilities like childcare facilities as well as surf clubs. So as time goes on to review those, we may review those in accordance with the community facilities policy. We can bring that back on, you know, into consideration. And as the Director of Governance has said, um, that would be similar sort of consideration for council at the time of any renewal for the airport. Um, well, I'm just wondering if we could just add a sentence saying that, um, as I think you just said, childcare aren't included in the policy. And but maybe... surf clubs. So there's a number that are listed in the beginning of the policy okay. that well, were outside of scope for the purposes of this policy. So is it possible just to add something along the lines of that other um, community facilities that aren't specifically addressed in the policy, um, well, they're not excluded merely by virtue of the fact that they're not included in the policy? So when they, when they need to be renegotiated, whether they're a surf club or whether they're a childcare or whether it's the airport, that this policy would be applicable? Could we add something like that? Yep. I don't know who uh, can I provide would the wording. That, that would be added to the policy as a currently excluded um, group being the airport and, and in that it gives a provision for the policy to be used as a guideline for any review. So that's in the policy? for the ones that are excluded so that it says that there's opportunities to consider it in in the future but so we can certainly add something in um if you're wanting the airport to be just so that they noted like, yeah because surf clubs and things as well we did discuss i remember going to some of the um there were sort of workshops i can't remember what Correct. they were called yes. there was some, yeah um i remember going to those and definitely surf clubs and childcare centers were raised but it just occurred to me that the airport is under community facilities but doesn't seem to get a Guernsey anywhere. So can someone assist with? A matter of including a list of those properties and facilities excluded from the policy. Do you want that in the forward or in the, as a note, an we appendix? We can just add the, add the airport to those currently yeah. excluded from yeah. the policy that could be, you know, could be considered in future developments. So it would be treated the same way as a surf club council of Greenaway. Mm. So can we just note that in the first instance? Yeah, just and maybe in the policy, can we have a, a section that explains why some things are excluded? Like so, it's, it's, it already is council of Greenaway. It is okay. All right, I don't remember that part. So they're either directly run by council or we're doing separate negotiations specifically. So surf clubs were treated as a separate class of group because of their, I mean, they still needed further work and uniqueness and they're at a different stage of tenure. So we can add that if that's what you'd like. So we got some more um, So I think it's just um, maybe before four that um, the draft policy be amended to include reference to the airport as an excluded facility. Is that... Does that capture it? Well, I thought you said they could be included in it in a later time or something, or could be that this policy could be referred to in the renegotiation of any deed of licence. So 
Is that not, not what you said? I was really more wanting to make it clear that this policy, policy should be considered in any further negotiations, even though it might not be directly applicable. Um, yep, and so Ms Fawn's saying that that um, is Say appropriate. That specifically. So include the draft policy effort and, and note that, it, that this policy should be considered in any future Negotiations, is that capturous? Any future negotiation of a... Lease negotiations, is that what you want? Well, or licence. Lease or licence negotiations, so be considered in any future lease or licence negotiation. That's probably clearer. Or equivalent. Lease or licence or equivalent. Because honestly, you wait and see, it won't be called either of those and then this won't apply. So. So just in brackets or equivalent? Licence or equivalent in brackets. Lease or licence in brackets or equivalent. Councillors, there are no other lights on, so write a reply. No. no. Okay, councillors, I'll put the motion as moved by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor McGregor. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Councillor Holstein, Councillor Smith, Councillor Vincent, Councillor Sundstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor McGregor, Councillor Greenway, Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Burke, Councillor Marquette, and Councillor Matthews. All those against? Abstention. Councillor Pillen and Councillor Best, you're abstaining? I declare the motion carried. Thank you. Councillors, I just need to leave the chamber for a brief moment so the Deputy Mayor will come up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, councillors. Item 3.4. Do we have a mover? Um, move, councillor Best. Do we have a seconder? Uh, seconder, councillor Marquette. Councillor Best, did you want to open debate? Uh, councillor Best. Um, for you, councillor Smith. Um, Mr Murphy. Um, this is a quite a significant um, audit report. I haven't seen one like it. Um, when Councillor I get, Best, can when you I, speak into the microphone? Just can't hear. When I get to page 223 of an attachment, which you won't be able to get to most probably, but by the time I finish talking, you'll have arrived there. But um, on that attachment, it says significant audit issues and observations. It goes on to outline that um, significant matters came to the attention during the audit and have been addressed, assessed as high risk. That, that's, I've never seen one like that. But what the question I raise is, is that what are those items? There are, some are flagged in here, like the 94 contribution robbery, but what are the items? Uh, to the CEO, Mr Murphy. Through you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Best, uh, with all due respect, I think it's probably best directing your question to the auditor, that is, the auditor's report. I'm happy to add any other comments that the auditor may not wish to make a comment on, uh, but the significant risk that has been identified has been identified by the auditor in the auditor's opinion. So you can't tell me what the risk is? I can, I can tell you what the risk is. What is identified? The matter that has been identified is, as stated there, a breach of the EPNA Act relating to the developer or the local infrastructure contributions. Mm -hmm. It says, it says plural on the top line, significant matters. That's more than one matter. But could I draw your attention to the, to the next line down? where it says these, plural, will be reported in the management letter from the final phase of the audit 
once formal management responses have been received. Well, that letter would be fascinating. Have you received that letter yet, Mr General Manager? I believe we have, Mr Best. Council the, the Mayor may have a copy as well. Would that be the case? Yes. Um, why do the other 14 councillors not have a copy of that letter, being that this is such a significant audit issue, Mr General Manager? Through you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, Councillor Best, the standard practice in relation to management leaders is <coughs> management has an opportunity to respond. That management letter then usually goes uh, back to the, <coughs> to the auditor. If uh, councillors wish to see a copy of that management letter, that can be made available. Would the audit committee have been provided a copy of this letter? Uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, Councillor Best, I understand that they have, yes. Oh, now the Audit Committee's got one, the Mayor's got one, you've got one, and the people that are making the decision don't have one. And that's reasonable policy and procedure. Um, Councillor Best, can I just clarify, are you requesting a copy of the letter to be distributed? Well, Is that just, what you'd like? I just don't want one. I, I, I wanted all these people to have one, regardless of what side the tracks they're on. We should all have that letter. Okay, so can and I just clarify, is there any issue about distributing that? Mr. CEO. But the point is we're going to vote on this this evening. This is, this is material information that makes a significant difference to what we see these reports as. And a, 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 an auditor does not write this stuff unless they, this is a really serious issue. And that letter would be, as I say, material to our decision here tonight. The letter exists in the building. The mayor has a copy, the general manager has a copy, and the audit committee has a copy, but the board doesn't have a copy. Why is that? All right, I can see I'm going to go nowhere with that, but we'll move on. Um, I'll speak to it. Thank you, Councillor Best. The councillors, I'm told that the report's not nine months late. I've been pulled up in my next motion coming for some wordsmithing semantics that people seem to feel that they need to engage in. Um, but um, we have asked for the accounts that are nine months after their due date. That's correct. Um, not late, but after their due date. And we can get a tick out of that one, can't we, staff, if we word it like that. Um, but we've got a $5.3 million loss. We've got, we've got an auditor here howling, saying you've got some really systemic issues, um, saying, uh, Council demonstrated poor governance over local infrastructure contributions, and that's one issue. The two words above matters um, is plural. So that's not the only issue we're going to find out when we get the letter. And what does that matter to us? Oh, well, it's all in the history. It doesn't really matter. Yes, it does. It's $5.3 million loss. You've got wages running out at 165. You've got You've got general rates running at $165 million, that's your general rate pool, and your wages are running at $220 million. It's about 1.3 times your income on general rates alone. Not that there aren't other incomes, I accept that, but, but just look at that and that's what you're running. That's, what you, that's the governance we've got. Now, where is the governance committee on this? Now, I have a high regard for some of those people in that governance committee, I know them, but I've got to tell you, the committee should have been right across this well and truly. We should have been in a room with the governance committee talking about this. It shouldn't, shouldn't be up to me to have to say, council, where's the letter? It shouldn't, you know? I mean, I can't get a Christmas card to Mother Teresa in this joint. We know that. But the reality is, is you know I'm speaking the truth, as I am with the body hire issue, which was raised by the ALP councillors of the Wyong Council and followed and prosecuted by myself and Councillor Eaton of the day because we understood it was patently wrong, because the unions backed up so hard on council for hiring people. I will raise this shortly, and I'll most probably get voted down again. But this issue is what it is. We can't change it, but boy, we can change how we go about it. And we're so quick to look in the rear vision mirror about governance, probity, arrangements, inverted commas, all the grassy knolls that we've got, but we've done, we've, we've proven nothing. We've achieved nothing. We haven't put a glove on Gosford or Wyong councils, but we've come in here with this great view that, you know, the evil Wyong council. It's not until you get to the helm of this ship that you realise how damn hard it is and you throw stones in the rear vision mirror. 
You should be looking in your own mirror. And here it is on this page. This is on our watch. This is in our room. This is our ratepayer money. And this is going to be a damning letter when it's released, if it's ever released. Thank you, Councillor Best. Councillor Marquette, did you want to speak a seconder? Deputy Mayor, just, just a quick question through you, if you don't mind, um, to, to CEO Murf, Mr Murphy. It, it's what um, Councillor Best has just alluded to on page 223 of the report, obviously in the bold red, the significant audit issues and observations. In, in your time in council, being a first termer, this is the first time I've seen this. Not surprising. I haven't been here for very long. Is this the first time you've seen something like this, or have you seen, if you have seen this before, on how many occasions have you seen this in a council? Uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, Councillor Marquette, yes, I have. I've actually uh, seen qualified audit opinions. Uh, I've seen issues raised by auditors previously, so it's not the first time, though. No. Okay, Th thank you. Just re really quickly, um, Madam Deputy Mayor, I'll speak to it. I, I do share um, Councillor Best's concerns. Um, that I don't want to be alarmist. That makes me feel a little bit better. I've, I've heard that this, this does happen. Um, it's good to see that obviously it was corrected, but in any business, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, I think, I think it's incumbent upon us to have a look at issues that have that've come to pass. I think we all need to see that letter. I think we all need to, to know why this happened. Of course, I said just before, we don't need to be operational, but we need to be responsible. And again, it doesn't matter what side of the tracks, what side of the fence you're on, if you're a fiscal conservative or of the, the, the opposite persuasion, it doesn't matter. We all want this place to run well. We all don't want these style of tags attached to something that we're, we all work hard. We're all in here, we're very late, and we, all, we might not always get on, but we're all, all trying to get to the same spot for the people of the Central Coast. We do not want these style of tags attached to the hard work we're doing, councillors. So I'd, I'd uh, want to applaud Councillor uh, Best for raising this. I think it's very important, and I think we really need to keep our eye on it, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Marquette. Councillors, I don't have any other speakers listed, um, so I will put the motion moved by Councillor Best, seconded by Councillor Marquette. All in favour, please raise your hand. Uh, there weren't any speakers against Councillor Best, so you didn't get a right of reply. Councillor Marquette, Burke, Pillen, Gale, McLaughlin, McGregor, Merton, Sundstrom, Hogan, I'm missing people now. Um, Councillor, I've got your name, Matthews. And Councillor Vest, Councillor Smith. Those opposed? Abstentions? Uh, Councillor Holstein, what, did you vote in favour? Uh, Councillor Vincent, were you in favour? You abstained. Were there any other abstentions? Sorry, just so that I make sure I get that right. So Councillor Greenaway and Councillor Vincent were abstentions and everybody else voted in favour. Uh, thank you, Councillors. I'll hand the chair back to the Mayor. Councillors, we have um, item number 3.5. Councillor Holstein, lights on. Move the recommendation. Do we have, have a, a second? Councillor McGregor, Councillor Holstein. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just look in moving the recommendations, there was uh, a couple of things I would ask both yourself as Mayor and the General Manager to uh, the CEO to take on board. There was a couple of issues there I had some concern with. Um, just trying to get a more definite update on uh, the railway upgrades for Point Clare, Narara, Niagara Park, Lizarrail, Rimba and Tugra. Um, they are a very important issue for our, our commuting population mm. Mm. and um, there's no set times in there, uh, amount of money to be advised. I'm, I'm keen to find out exactly where they're situated. I thought in your next meeting with the Parliamentary Secretary of the Central Coast you may be able to get us an update uh, beyond that and just keep us briefed on that. The second issue, uh, which was a, of a concern to me, and is again just for the senior staff and yourself, Madam Mayor, to take on board, um, uh, was within the West Ward. There are three projects totalling $10.5 million. The Lemon Grove Netball at 1.45, your minor uh, recreational reserve at 8.25, and the Rogers Park at 800,000. These uh, are projects where the staff have rightly submitted information as far back as eight months ago. 
So Rogers Park information was submitted to them eight months ago, your minor seven months ago, and Lemon Grove five months ago. Seems to be a little bit too, we should be getting some answers back. I'm very concerned. They are key projects, particularly the Amino um, Recreational Hub at 8.25 million. And I'd just like to get a little bit of more feedback on after that length of time, surely we can expect um, some commitment. We've got a commitment, but actually getting the funding through so that staff can do the necessary planning and implementation works. Thank you. Um, Council Holstein, we'll certainly put that on the agenda for the next meeting that we've got. We're just trying to locate when that meeting is just to give councillors some um, a date for that. Thanks. Uh, councillors, there are no other lights on. Did, no? Okay. Did you want right to reply? Oh, Council McGregor, did you want to speak? No. no? Uh, Council Holstein, right to reply? Yeah. No? Okay. Therefore, I'll put the motion as moved by Councillor Holstein, second by Councillor McGregor. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Unanimous. Thank you, councillors. Uh, yeah, three points. No, it's three. Three point seven. Councillor Smith, I know you. Did you still? Did you want to move it? Yep. Dation. Oh, you might it. No, yes. no. Didn't need to star it. Sorry. Three point seven. It is. Yeah. Councillor Mertens. Councillor Holstein, did you want to speak to that, Councillor Mertens? Oh, sorry, I'll just find you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to staff for uh, bringing this back uh, with relative quickness, especially considering uh, just how long this has been going on, some um, 10 plus years now. Uh, I think what the community has been calling out for, especially since the fire that happened more than 12 months ago now, uh, is progress on this. Um, the DA and the, and the land sale have been held up uh, by the former Gosford Council and then under administration. Um, so I'm very happy that this is finally moving forward and now putting this lot back onto, onto the market and to talk to um, the neighbouring developer uh, to finally move forward with this DA. Uh, it's gone to um, absolute rack and ruin, the site. I'm not sure if anyone's seen it down on, on Ocean Beach Road. Um, the entire outside is now covered in graffiti. Uh, it's become uh, quite an eyesore and I, I get probably weekly, if not more regular than that, um, complaints from people about just what can we do about this uh, and this is what we are doing. This is what we're doing for this lot. Um, hopefully it's, uh, it's, it'll be back on the market and, and sorted very soon so the DA can progress. Uh, I have been made aware of, of several um, complaints uh, or several um, campaigns being run that this will result in uh, the, the laneway access being uh, ceased for residents. Um, reviewing the DA and on consultation with staff um, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, the developer is looking, based on the current DA that has been approved uh, by the former Gosford Council, uh, that all laneways and current road, um, um, road areas that were on the former, um, former that existed before the fire uh, will be retained so people can drive in and out on those roads, um, as will the existing laneway access from Pozieres. Um, so even if those were closed, which they're not going to be, would still be accessible via Pozieres. So, um, I do thank staff um, for bringing this action and actually getting this back on the table, um, for regaining that value as opinion so we can actually get this solved. Uh, I know that many people in the community will be very happy to have this finally done, um, and I would commend this motion to Council. Councillor Holstein, did you want to speak to this? No? There are no other lights on. Councillor Rod, reply? No. Okay, therefore, councillors, I'll put the motion as moved by Councillor Merton, second by Councillor Holstein. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Councillor Vincent, are you up, down? Down? Okay. So, Councillor Best, Councillor, sorry, if I can get hands up. Councillor Best, Councillor Holstein. You're, okay, Councillor Sunstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor Hogan. Green, Councillor Greenway, what are you? Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Gale, Councillor Pillen, Councillor Burke, Councillor Marquette. All those against? Councillor Vincent, Councillor Greenway, abstention. Councillor Smith, I declare the motion carried. Thank you, councillors. Uh, the 3.8, Councillor Best. You're moving as is. Well. Hey? So, okay, sorry. Right. Councillor Best. I just got it done. You know, this is fetching, isn't it? 
Um, Councillor Sundstrom, thank you for chairing the um, Animal Cares Committee um, last week. Uh, I had another engagement which um, didn't permit me to sit in that meeting, but the, um, some of the members said to me they, they thought you were good at what you did there, so thank you. Some of them said you glared at them, but they said they were playing up too, but that's all right. Um, seriously, this, this issue that's going to run here, and the public, look, they won't really know much about it because the gallery's gone and they've gone to bed, but oh, most of them have joy. I passed some people's bedtime. Um, but um, this motion that I've cobbled together here, and I'm happy for it to get refined if, if we want to refine it further, so that staff can, can do some refining if they so wish. But in, in, in principle, that's what I want to put forward. Um, and I genuinely want to put it forward, uh, forward on behalf of the council, all of us. And, and we smile a bit about this. We have a bit of a you know, besties cat committee, you know, you know, give him a cat or a mother to raise a card and it'll all quite calm him down, get him on his medication or something. But look, this, this is a really important issue. If we, if we can crack this one in our lifetimes, you know, some of us are going to be a bit longer than others. I'll read the play. But, but seriously, if you, could, if you could just one day dream that we actually treat these things as we treat the dogs and we put them behind fences, we look after them, we have them on leads, we pick up their poo after them. I mean, who would have thought 20 years ago that you'd be running around with plastic bags picking up dog poo? I mean, they just laugh at you at the beach. All you do is just, just tread in the stuff and your thong's running across the beach to get the next wave. And that was just the way it was at the beach. They were all over the beach doing it everywhere. But now, no, you're not doing that with your dog at the beach. The dog fights, there used to be dog fights in the school playground. They'd get into the... He'd get into the lunch room and eat all the kids, our kids, we kids, lunches, and the dog would just eat all the lunches, and that's what would happen in the in the hat room, and and kids would be bitten in the playground. The dog wasn't shot or anything, you know. The owner came down, got the dog, took him home, and we had to go and get a band aid on our hand, and that was it. No no shots or rabies or any. But but how much it's changed is my point. So the point is that if we can take this on and get the other councils to get their act together, um, you just might make a difference, you know, and I. I know there's a wry smile to this, but you know we are losing we are losing our natives. There's no two ways about it. We're just losing them. We know we're losing them, you know, and they won't be around in another 50 years' time. They just won't be here. Jane pushes the barrow pretty hard, and I know we push back on you, but I understand your heart's in it. It's just how we go about getting there is the difference in this room. And there's nothing wrong with that difference. It makes for a robust outcome, but this one can make such a difference by just how we manage those creatures. Um, and you don't have to have pushback from people. You know, we got a little bit of <coughs> with the dogs, but, but the dog thing is now working. You know, it's working very well. You feel safe walking in the park. You know the dog's on a leash over there. You know if you've got a kid with your grandkid or your own kids, they're not going to get attacked. You don't have to grab the kid and put him on his shoulders because the dog's jumping up to eat you. That doesn't happen anymore. So this can actually happen on our generation's watch. Same as we did for the whales. And we did. We saved them. Councillor Sundstrom. I got rise to uh, support the motion, and um, I want to take the opportunity to uh, both congratulate and thank the people that are involved in the Companion Animal uh, Committee. Again, it's another great example of the community and the council working together. The people on that committee make a difference every day in their. Um, uh, in their endeavours in animal matters um, and they bring a wealth of information and experience to the councillors that attend. And um, I'll agree with uh, Councillor Best um, that sometimes this committee gets a bit of a snigger and a bit of a, a smile. But I would encourage any, I'll use the term again, any interested councillors, if you are interested in what this council is up to, come along to the committee, have a look, and uh, you might learn something, and you might even learn a little bit about how valuable our community advisory boards are. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McGregor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Obviously, some of us might have realised there was some highlighted um, text up there, and point two asked for the insertion of names. So I'd like to nominate myself to be the voting delegate. I 
and attendees. So how many, any councillor can go. So councillor Best, councillor Smith, councillor Sundstrom. That's okay, but if we at least get the attendees in, you can find out. So you are possible, Councillor Greenaway. Any other takers? Canberra. Canberra. Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Burke. Um, I probably can go for half. So Councillor Matthews. You're down. No, he so he doesn't want to go. Okay, so any other names that want to be added to that list? Okay, so you want to be added to the list and then you'll that's let them know. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah, Councillor Vincent. You've skewered at both ends now. It's Canberra. Canberra. National Assembly, June 14 through to 17. It's a weekend. <laughs> Councillor Gale. Yeah, 15th is the Monday, so there'll be no council meeting, I take it, on that Monday, 15th of June. So it's the 14th, which is the Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Sorry, you're... Okay, Councillor Pillen. So, <laughs> councillors, oh, Councillor Hogan, we must say everybody all bar Councillor Marquette. Hogan, Marquette, and Matthews, are you going? Yes, well, I'll put it down. So, councillors, we will need no, to know. No, 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 take mine off. She would like to do one. Oh. So that's an absolute waste of ratepayers' money. Take mine off. Thanks for that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, councillors, you will need to, um, the CEO has asked that. You get back to him by the end of the week, if that's okay, please, if people can get back so that we can make arrangements because it is June, it's not that far away. Thank you. Can I talk to it now? Is that I've had the call Excuse me, Councillor Vincent. You agree, do you? Councillor Vincent. Is Sorry, Councillor Hogan. Oh, Councillor Vincent's got the floor. Sorry, oh, cool. Councillor McGregor is asked a question. Sorry. I. I understand. Have call like three minutes ago. Yeah. Um, look, I was just going to say that I think it's it's a positive thing for councillors and staff to go to this. At the last national local government assembly, um, there was a great focus on revenue for councils, hence the voting delegate, and particularly on waste and the future of the waste industry, um, and also cost shifting, which comes up at the state one quite a lot. But what we're what we're actually going down there to do is professional development, and it's about learning, and it's about learning how the best practice councils are operating and how we too can bring back some of these ideas. So this is not a, a waste of money. It's not a complete and utter waste of time, as some people might say. There actually is important conversations to be had down there. There's important sessions to attend and important knowledge to be gained. And I, for one, think that it's quite a positive thing to learn from other people's experiences and to see what some of the leading councils are doing, not just in New South Wales, but across the, the country. So. They would be the reasons that I would put forward to attend and I would encourage others to do as well. If you have work commitments or, or otherwise, please let the staff know beforehand because we have had trouble before with conferences where councillors have put their name down and not gone. So I would encourage everyone who can go to go, but if you're unable to for whatever reason, please let the staff know as possible, as soon as possible. Thank you. I know you have an amendment. I'm just going, Council Vincent's going to. Um, Madam, 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 I'm just looking, statement. For clari just looking for clarification from the general manager on what's required by Friday. Is it a, a commitment for accommodation to be booked or is it? Through you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> uh, Councillor Vincent, yes, it's really, un <coughs> I've he um, heard some councillors tonight saying they need to check if they've got work commitments or all these sort of things. As <coughs> Councillor McGregor said, we have had situations in the past <coughs> where staff have booked accommodation, they've let the organisers know, and then there's a last minute cancellation, which often means that we cannot get a, a refund on the accommodation or the registration. So uh, if we can reduce that uh, that risk, that's all the better for for council. I, so uh, I don't know how to handle this, but as a shift worker, I don't have a roster for June as yet. I don't know if I'm rostered on or not then. So um, with, you know, Good intent. I would like to attend, but 
So if, you, if I could have my name down there but not have accommodation booked and be a late registration, if that's the best way to manage that, I'm not sure. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, Councillor Vincent, I think you just have to do the best that you can and we'll, we'll work to accommodate you. I appreciate that you may not have your shifts out this I'm far in advance. So, but I think as a general rule, what I'm, what I'm saying is that if people can uh, make some plans and then stick to them because otherwise, you know, it does muck the staff around who are trying to organise things at the last minute. I'm OK to book my own accommodation to stay in Canberra if that's an issue. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, Council Vincent, I don't think that that's so much the issue. It's just around being being organised. So, look, we can take it offline. If you, as soon as you know, then you can let the staff know when you when you're available or not available. So, happy to leave your name down. It's got their subject availability, so the staff are aware of that. Okay, thank you. Council Greenaway. Uh, two things. Firstly, um, the motion that's proposed. Um, it does refer to cat curfews, but then it says that they're no barrier to feral cats and local governments, um, they're not trying to um, put feral cats inside. So I just wondered if we can delete the word feral because the Companion Animals Act really only applies to domestic cats other than sort of capturing feral cats. So if the mover of the motion is happy to remove feral, that would be good. And then I've got a subsequent um, motion about a different matter. Right, so yeah, it's just, just says, so you're Because we're not cats? dealing with feral cats in that instance. With cats? Instance. Okay, anything else? You said you um, had two? Yes, my motions. Oh. You, so, do you want to add something yeah, to it's it? It's up there now. This is just almost identical to the one that we um, asked our council staff to send a letter to Water Services Association of Australia around standardising water restrictions. So I just thought if um, ALGA could also write... Um, they'll similarly, they'll probably get a similar response, but at least other councils can see that there's an opportunity to try to standardise these sorts of things and see whether there's a benefit. So that's my proposed motion. Yep. Okay. All right. Added to the motion, so that's fine. Okay. Councillor Zett. Sorry, do you want to, are you wanting to speak? Well, Councillor Sundstrom. I just wanted to, um, through you, Madam Mayor, ask a question to Councillor Greenaway. When she when she refers to when Councillor Greenaway refers to um, standardising water restrictions, you're only talking about the um, the ask on the community. You're not talking about uh, triggers or anything like that, are you? Um, because that would be difficult to standardise. No, um, about standardising water restrictions so they're consistent in each council. Okay, um, we maybe could clarify that. Um, so that each level, so the definition of each level is consistent. So what about if just for, so the requirements Sorry, Councillor Sunson, I've just, the CEO's just politely said to me that um, that is already a resolution of council, so you really can't debate what she's writing because that purely is already a, motion, a resolution of this council. In but, that format. Okay, but we're using it for a different purpose now. So yeah, I'm no, just using I'm, that as I'm a draft. I'm not talking to... I'm actually saying Councillor Sunstrom wanted you to make some changes. The General Manager has instructed that it's already a resolution of Council, so really we're just copying that resolution. So, so Councillor Sunstrom couldn't debate changing word wording. We can't debate it on a previous resolution of Council, but we can change it a bit for this new resolution, can't we? Um, Because this is going to ALGA, that's different to what we've Councillor said. Councillor Sundstrom, what? Uh, um, just for you, Madam Mayor, to the CEO, do you think there's any um, problems with the way that's worded? And is my request um, just superfluous? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Sundstrom, what I was saying to the, to the Mayor was from a principal perspective, once Council has made a resolution, uh, that stands. However, if you want to, and I wasn't sure where you were going with it, so if you wanted to go against the council resolution, that wouldn't be appropriate. 
but Councillor Greenaway is also correct in that this is now a motion going up to ELGA, so you can um, add or, or um, amend the, the basic wording as you, as long as the, the chamber agrees to it, of course. Can, uh, can I get an opinion from you then on that question, though? Is Do you think that the wording is suitable and has the effect desired and is being specific about uh, just being the call on the community and how they react to the restrictions, a separate concept uh, to the triggers. Uh, Councillor Sundstrom, I think what you've written there should be fine. Okay. All right, I'll withdraw then. <laughs> Could we just have R change to is because it's now singular, that's all right. Where it's flashing R. R to oh. is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Because it's definition. So are you comfortable with that, Councillor Sundstrom? Yeah. Councillor Best's motion. Okay, Councillors, there are no further lights on. Councillor Best, did you want to write a reply? No? Councillors, I'll put the motion as moved by Councillor Best, seconded by... Sorry, I've lost... Who is it? Councillor Sundstrom. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Unanimous. Thank you, Councillors. Okay, we're moving on to 3.9, Councillor Smith. Do I have a seconder for the motion? Councillor McGregor? Um. Uh, I don't need to speak to it. My, um, my issue was addressed in the earlier motion about the consolidated LEP, so I'm happy just to move it as is. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor McGregor, did you want to speak to it? Um, no, I'd like to see us press on. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. There are no other lights on, Councillors. I'll put the motion as moved by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor McGregor. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Unanimous. Thank you, councillors. Councillors, now move into the notices of motion. So, first one is so the first one, 6.1, has been formally withdrawn by Councillor Best. So, we'd like that minuted, I guess, that, that this motion has been withdrawn. Yep. Do we actually have to move it? No. Okay, that's minuted. As um, that's been withdrawn, uh, we have our six point two notice of motion uh, nine million agency agreement slash body hire. Uh, Councillor Best and Marquette. So, Councillor Best, are you moving it? Addendums to it that I just did in line of the staff reply, which was fascinating. So, in one, all I've changed is rather than have um, nine months late, because you'll recall there was in-depth discussion in this report that it wasn't nine months late. Well, it's it's not nine months. That was changed. That was changed. The changed version will turn up. That's correct. So the top line reads nine months after the end of the financial year and to <coughs> said before council receive, well council has already received, why on council received it? I thought this council might want to receive it but that was, that was ruled out by staff so I've just put the word note in there so we're only noting this 430 report. We're not receiving it and I'm sure that'll make a world of difference to everybody. Um, and I'll speak to it. <clears throat> um, councillors, we, we've touched on a fair bit of this now. Um, there is an interesting staff response to it. I don't know if you've had time to read it. But um, I am most concerned, councillors, that this not be <clears throat> a report that is done by staff. It has to be at arm's length. If we have got any ounce of governance left in us and this issue has come to the fore, we cannot have the staff doing this. It has to be done by an independent body. And some will go, oh, well, we'll give it to the governance committee. Well, that's fine. But this happened 
with the governance committee in place. So how does that happen? Now, there was a very awkward time in Wyong back in 2007 when this started to happen back then. And we had some extraordinarily robust discussions behind closed doors. And we got a lot of pushback. You will not do this. We want independent legal advice. You remember, <coughs> Madam Mayor, you were there. You were there when we tried to do this. And we said, look, this is just such a can of worms. We need independent legal advice. No, you're not getting it. You haven't got authority to do it. You're not going to do it. Not on our watch. We pushed so hard as a collegiate. We all got together and said, listen here. We want an independent legal advice. Read our lips. Caved in. Got it. Took months to do that. Got the independent legal advice. The legal advice said, guys, you're on toast. This is just not what you're, good, you're doing. You know, the, the unions were on the, back, on the back burner, simmering away, not happy, Jan. It resulted in this 4.30 report, which I put in just the first page, um, and it's a 224-page report. And it ended up saying words like systemic maladministration had occurred, um, uh, that f four of the 30 contracts involved expenditure exceeding $150,000. Contracts at 150 grand need to come in here. They've changed to 250 now, but when this was done, they needed to come in here. Then, of course, we've got, and I just don't have time for this tonight. This is just, you know, like this is crazy that I have to run through this. This is ridiculous. Um, there are responses here that we, we procure them from, from all these different sources on page eight of the report. We procure from all these outfits. When you procure, you have to tender. When you tender, you have to get reports. When you have reports over 150 grand, they come into this room, and that's the process we signed off on. Now they're 250 grand. But when this was done, it's 150. And that hasn't happened. And there's $9 million, and this is continuing. Now, I understand, Madam Mayor, that, that in many cases, you have to have your lollipop people, you have to have all your other people. But we have got a large rented floor space, which I'm sure none of you are across, up at North Wyong, where we have got tables and chairs of staff, that they're contractors, paid extraordinary amounts of money contracting who are not staff members. I mean, did you know that we were renting a building up the road here for floor space because we just needed to do that? And we've got in that heaps and heaps of staff. I didn't know till I was told by the back door. Why didn't we know that? And, and this, is, this, is, this is put on the business paper as, a, as agency hire. What does agency hire look like? Why don't you just say it's contracts? What's your point of order, Council Vincent? That until I found with Councillor Best's address there, I was just listening to it, and he said I didn't know that until I heard it through the back door. I'm just wondering what he means by the back door. He knows what I mean. I'm not going to answer him. Go to go to wherever you wish to well, go, mate. Um, Councillor Vincent, that's actually a question. It's not a point of order. That's right. So it's you can. Uh, Fifteen years he's been here, and he keeps doing it. So look, Sorry. this is a really Sorry. serious it's issue. This is not a Mother Teresa Christmas card moment. This is going to have to be looked at. This is about governance, serious, serious governance. And if you want, you can dust me off, that's fine, but this is going to stay alive. And if we don't give this out to another agency to look at, we will sorely be tested. And I'll put on record here, if we don't, I personally will be writing the letters tomorrow to the OLG. And maladministration, by the way, which sits in this 4.30 report, and that's what they found against Wyong, Maladministration sits next to corruption, and maladministration and corruption are both investigatable by the ICAC. I don't want to go there. And in fact, Bruce asked the other day, I don't want to come back in unless I know what the laundry looks like. There's your laundry. Uh, Councillor Marquette, a seconder, did you want to speak? Uh, Madam Mayor, I'd, I will rise to say that I do support this motion. I'd, I'd put my name to this one because I think we definitely need clarification um, around this space. It's at it, uh, the last council meeting, Council Best brought, the, brought this um, figure to the attention of the chamber out of the report. Um, it's a little bit like I said before regarding when I spoke to the audit. Um, we've got a responsibility to not just quantify the dollar like I was talking about before. We've got a, a responsibility to quantify our actions to the people of the Central Coast as well. Um, we certainly don't want this to be brought up as a major problem later and, and a majority of us voted this down. 
Um, I think this is something else that we can all agree on as well. We just we simply need to find out what's happened here, exactly what's happened, why it's happened, and what we need to do about it. So I will definitely be voting for this one, and I hope um, the rest of um, the councils in the room will do the same. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Smith. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to move an amendment that I've been... I did give to the staff. If I could get that up on the screen, that would be great. Uh, so it is as it appears on the screen. Um, I'll just give people a chance to read it and see if I've got a seconder. Ah, oh, Councillor McGregor seconded. Uh, so, Madam Mayor, I, I do take seriously Councillor Vest's comments and his points. I suppose where we significantly differ is his approach. Um, that good governance is not the approach that Councillor Best is taking on this issue. The, um, appropriate way would be is to seek more information from staff and to clarify the issues that he's raising. So uh, without the, um, uh, the um, hyperbole that Councillor Best likes to insert in everything, um, this amendment actually seeks to try and get a bit more information. I understand from the report that the CEO provided that there is um, a report due to Council at the end of April. Um, so I think we do need to have a look at that. Um, I do think we also need to ensure that if the former Wyong Council did come asunder on this particular issue, that we don't follow that lead um, and that we do make sure it is in the annual work program of ARIC to review this and provide advice to Council. Um, I, I suppose I'd, if councillors wish, I would be happy to add in that we do get um, some detailed information in a briefing, more than happy to do that. Um, but I, I suppose that is contingent on Councillor Best and Marquette attending a briefing. Um, and I, I mean that in all seriousness, uh, these are important questions and it would, would be good to have those two councillors there to work through the information. And if there is an issue, by all means, let's take it further. Um, but I would really like to um, manage this these questions in a professional and appropriate way by getting that information. Um, my other comment is that I, um, I might be wrong, but I thought we did have advice from staff about um, locations off-site from the Gosford and Wyong admin buildings. At some point, I thought councillors were made aware that in our review of our workspace that that was an investigation that was happening. Um, so maybe it was, maybe I'm, being a bit vague on that, but um, it was a while ago. Um, yeah, so so um, that's all I need to say on that motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Do I second her, Councillor McGregor? Yeah, would you like to speak? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I rise to support Deputy Mayor Smith's amendment. Um, this is a very serious issue, and it's one that needs to be looked at forensically rather than heading off into the bushes with an elephant gun looking for the skeletons. <laughs> to use the metaphors that repeatedly pop up in this chamber. Um, the other information that I think is extremely important is to have information provided to us by directorate on how many direct staff they have and how many contractors they're using. We should also be provided with a list of contractors. And what we really need to be doing is looking to make sure that these contractors are code compliant. It's a very simple way of doing this. You get their staff lists, you can go through if they're paying superannuation, long service leave, all the relevant insurances, all you have to do is go and match them up. As someone who used to do that in the construction industry with body hire companies, you can pretty easily work out which ones are dodgy and which ones aren't. There's also various other databases that show you when companies Phoenix themselves, for instance, which is a very common practice in the industry. And I'd be very interested in getting information around our tendering process to see how we are actually investigating this. There are different anecdotal reports that several of us have received at various points. I'm not going to name names, but there is one particular project where I was told by people in the community that the reason why it was delayed was because we weren't getting people to work on Saturdays and Sundays because we didn't want to pay them the extra money. I'd be very keen in finding out if that was actually the truth. I hope that that is not the case. I do not believe that staff would be knowingly doing that. I, having 
worked with or for various different contractors at different point in time. I think we all know that that kind of stuff does happen. The other thing that we should really be looking at is when these companies are tendering for it is the margins. Because in a lot of industries, particularly in civil and uh, residential construction, but civil is particularly important for, the, for our industry, you're seeing a lot of people putting in low tenders with a 1% margin or the like, and you know straight away for a fact, basically, with a tiny amount of research that these people are either from a company that's gone bankrupt before, set up a new one or on, and a, on a to um, various dodgy practices. We all know these things exist. State and federal government tenders and projects specifically make sure that companies are paying at least at a bare minimum the award, although you'll find with state and federal government um, projects that they're actually supposed to be co-compliant through playing, paying EBA wages, which is another issue which has um, come up a few times in this council. We need to get the forensic information. You don't need to be... Um, Basically, all you need to be able to do is someone who can actually read a report and see if someone's following the law or not. Now, I'm sure that our staff are trying their best to ensure that we are hiring the best companies that can provide the best quality of work so we don't have to pay twice and we're not giving lifeblood to vampires out there who are, who are doing the wrong thing. But this is something we need to take seriously. So I implore the ELT to provide us with the relevant information to make informed and relevant decisions up uh, as we have to vote on them here. And the other thing that I think is also an extremely important point to make is that we should be working in collaboration and conjunction with the relevant trade unions, be they the United Services Union, the ETU, the TWU, or their peak representative body unions, New South Wales, because when you work together with different aspects of the industry, you find that you usually get a better outcome for everyone, and a lot of these problems are avoided before they become problems. Thank you, Councillor McGregor. Councillor Vincent? Um, thanks, Madam Mayor. Question three, you. Uh, to Councillor Best about his comment on getting his information through the back door. I'm just curious what the back door is because there's uh, some um, guidelines on councillors seeking information and there has been councillors in previous councils that have had interactions with staff, even had staff at, at their offices detailing information and uh, which uh, I think was deemed to be inappropriate. but. Um, without going into any specifics, but what does Councillor mean by getting his information through the back door? Councillor Best? Do you... I'll that. You're nonsense. Um, Could I ask Councillor Best another question then? No, I'm not going to answer. He doesn't know the question yet. Through you, Madam Mayor, ask... to Councillor Best. Are you sure you haven't been gathering inappropriate information in breach of the Local Government Act? Sorry, Councillor Holstein. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I looked closely, as like everybody else has said here this evening, the importance of the issue. Um, and uh, I must say, even that time where Wyong found themselves with, uh, I think the wording was um, bad administration, the issue that was discovered then, maladministration. Um, maladministration. Yeah, concerns there. That was at a time that I was in Gosford. It wasn't evident to us at that stage, or I don't recall that being. I suppose one of the things in regard to the motion moving forward, and I can see that the uh, uh, the amendment going to um, is going to get up here. I think it has the numbers, but can I just ask uh, within that, and whether it needs to be part of the motion or whether the officers take it on board, I'd like to see some benchmarks, and benchmarks in regard to other council areas. What is those anticipated uh, levels? Uh, in a council. I know we're a fairly large council, but it would be good to see what the benchmarks are in other councils so we can start comparing apples to apples in regard to what... You can't benchmark an, an illegal act. I'm not asking to benchmark an illegal act. I'm asking for the relevant information in regard to what other councils are doing in regard to the issue uh, that's been brought to us this evening. What are those levels of... That, that is done in other council Councillor areas. Councillor Holstein, have you got some words? No, no, I don't. Madam Mayor, I've just said to the officers whether they can take that on board or whether the mover of the amendment, which I believe is going to get up, needs to add to it. Either way, I'd like to know what other councillors, um, other council areas have in their benchmarks or what are figures of comparable council areas. We, That's all I'm asking. Can we just do a comparison? Yep, and just request that the CEO provide a comparison um, with other similar sized councils? 
Councillor The benchmark in regard to councils that have gone through the process of amalgamation. Right, yeah? Because that has got to be a concerning, that has to be a contributing factor. Right. Councillor Smith, are you happy with that to a motion? <laughs> yep. Councillor McGregor. Thank you. Councillor Best. Look, I think you're beginning to get it, um, except for Councillor Vincent, who wants to try and shoot the messenger as he usually does. But that's okay. I'm used to him. Um, yeah. Councillor Vincent, what's your point of clock, order? Clock, please. I, I'd ask Councillor uh, Best to retract. Councillor Vincent isn't trying to shoot the messenger. Councillor Vincent's trying to find out if the messenger is basing his facts on appropriately inf information gained through channels. And I'm just curious what the back door is, because if he's operating on back door information, I'd, 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 Councillor Vincent, that, what is to your me, point gives of order? Kind of, I'd, ask, I'd ask him to retract, shoot the messenger. Councillor Best? I won't. So Beg your pardon? I won't, because it's not a point of order. So now, if I can just help us here, we've, we've got a, a number. Well, first of all, you're asking the army to invest its own, investigate itself or the police to investigate them. So that's what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Well, well, Eric, Eric, is this on Eric's watch, for goodness sake? This, this is what you're facing. I've been there. You've been there, Madam Mayor. You know how hard this was. This is deja vu for us. This is exactly the same tone that we got in Wyong. Oh, push back, push back, shoot the messenger. The union spoke to the ALP councillor in Wyong. That was the back door then. And they worded that ALP councillor up and said, listen, this is, this is, this is contracting. These are meant to be rank and file employees with entitlements. And it's full of people that aren't. What are you doing in there? That's the back door that went on back there. And that's exactly what I think is happening here. Now, I could be wrong, but I think that you need to ask an independent referee, which is the OLG. And in the staff report, it says, it says in here that the OLG, it's not their core business. Well, that most probably isn't their core business, but they wrote that. That's a 223-page report from the OLG on why on council's efforts in the same subject. Now, I'm not suggesting the staff are doing this because they just want to get us all into an interesting environment. I think they're doing it because they have to do it to make the wheel go around. The technology issues in this place are very hard to manage with the, with the integration. And that's why we've got all these people sitting. You know, this, this number two is going to going to get you, number two is going to get you lollipop people. It's not going to get you the people that you're looking for. That's the answer that's going to come back. You haven't asked the right question. You haven't got the question. And then the bottom here, you're asking for the CEO to give a comparison. A comparison of what? You don't even know what you've got in the first place and you're asking for a comparison of it. I mean, give me strength. You're running at it the wrong way. You have got to get independent advice. None of us here are experts. We, we sense there's something, Lucy, you know this is exactly what happened at Wyong. We sensed it was not right. We weren't certain. We didn't want to point fingers all over the room. We understood the staff were working with us, but this has happened. How do we go forward with it? You put your hands up, you step back, and you go, independent authority, please have a look for us. Silly councillors, you've misunderstood. It's not a problem. Councillor Best, naughty. Oh, hang on. You've got a 230-page report, and you really shouldn't have done that, boys and girls. That's the other side of it, and that's what came out of Wyong. So I'm not making this up and dreaming up what'll happen. I've been through it, along with you, Lisa. Others went through it. It wasn't easy for the time, but this is exactly what happened back then is what's happening and starting to happen here. This will be kicked down the road. It will get to an election. The next council is going to come in here and go, my God, look what you've left us. So I think, I think you, you get an independent. This is nice, but you get an independent and step back. You don't investigate your own shooting. Um, you kept pointing to me, so um, this happened in 2007, it started, but from my memory, if my memory serves me right, um, yep, there was some issues about body hire, but we also knew there was issues. So I guess for me, at this stage, we need to understand exactly what that figure represents and who it represents. We don't have that information just yet. So I'm certainly comfortable to, in asking the CEO to gather the information. We don't, you seem to know through whatever avenues you know, the rest of us don't know what you're referring to. You, you keep telling us that it's 
something else, it's not this, it's something else, but we don't know what the something else is. So um, I'm speaking against your motion but for the amendment because I believe that we need to get the information first so we actually know what we're talking about. Right now we're just picking up sticks, collecting sticks that we don't even know what the sticks look like. So I'm certainly speaking against your motion but moving forward the amendment. I'm also aware once we have the facts and we actually know what the beast looks like, then sure, if it needs to be investigated because it looks like there's something further going on, then I'm more than happy to go down that path. But I believe that we need the information first from the staff because you seem to know something that none of us, well, I don't know. So I'm happy to wait for that information. Um, Councillor Smith, did you? Yeah. Oh, Councilman Greg, your light's back on. Oh, I've got to move a procedural at the end of the debate. Right, okay. So there are no further lights on, so I will give you the right of reply, Councillor. Uh, just briefly, um, could I just get some clarification from either the CEO or Director of the Governance? Um, um, ARIC is being set up as intended to be an independent audit and risk and improvement committee. Is that correct or is it not independent? Mm -hmm. So at this stage, councillors, you have three independent paid members as yep. professional members of ARIC and then you have councillor representation. Yep. Into the future, under the new model the local government is currently consulting on, they will move to having complete independence with no councillors involved. All right, thank you for that clarification. Um, notwithstanding that there are council representatives on ARIC, um, I, I feel it would be safe to say that the independent personnel would not put their own reputations at risk. Um, in not casting an independent eye over these matters. Um, so, so I'm comfortable with the amendment as the first step, um, but I would say, commend Councillor Best on being so vocal about some serious maladministration that happened under his and Mr Eaton's watch. So I commend you on that, Councillor Best, um, but I commend the amendment. Thank you. So, councillors, I will move the amendment as moved by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor McGregor. All those in favour, please raise your hand. The amendment. Councillor Holstein, Councillor Smith, Councillor Vincent, are you? This is Councillor Smith's amendment. Councillor Vincent, Councillor Sunstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor Hogan, Councillor McGregor, Councillor Greenway, Councillor Matthews. All those against the amendment. Councillor Best, Councillor. McLaughlin, Councillor Gale, Councillor Pillen, Councillor Burke, Councillor Marquette. I declare the amendment carried. The amendment now becomes the motion. Oh, sorry, is there an abstention? No, there's none. Okay, so the amendment now becomes the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. Councillor Unanimous. Thank you, councillors. Councillors, now move on. To, so, councillors, it's uh, just off. It's ten past five past or t from here. I'm saying it's seven past ten. We have one, two, three, four, five matters pending. Um, can I maybe move a procedural and ask if anybody's happy to defer any of their notice of motions so that we can maybe just. Have a look at those. So your 6.5 you're happy to defer and your procedure is to actually deal with the confidential. Sure. Okay. Okay. So anybody else want to, Councillor McLaughlin, you're happy to defer? Okay, 6.4 to defer. Okay, the rescission motion, 7.1 can be referred, deferred for a fortnight, so a, a month. Okay, end of April. Just through you, Madam Mayor, just to be clear, there's only one meeting in April, which is the end of April, so it'll be a while. Okay. So therefore that now leaves 6.3 and 8.1. Can I just ask, is there any opposition to 6.3? 
Okay. I'm conscious that I don't want to go into confidential and then come back out to do the last. The item's not live just yet, so conscious that we've got 20 minutes to debate two possible items. Can we do it, councillors? Well, I'm going to go into confidential, so the, get, and then we have to come back out of confidential and do the final matter, and the final matter may not get done. Okay, well, all right, well. <laughs> Okay, well, if that's the... So we're going into confidential. So, all right, so we're deferring items 6.4, 6.5 and 7.1 to the April. So they're the... And then we're moving a procedural motion also to go into confidential now to do the 8.1. Do I have a mover of that? That's myself, seconded by Councillor McGregor. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Sorry? Is everybody okay with that? Is that a yes, unanimous to do that? Unanimous? No, abs okay, Councillor Best and Councillor Pillins abstained. The rest are all to, for that. I declare the motion carried. We'll move into confidential. Thank you, Councillors.
Councillors, again, we're now one minute to go. So for how long, sorry? Ten? Ten minutes. There will be no second extension. Yep. Okay, ten minutes. Those, all those in favour of ten minutes extension so we can just get the last matter done. Raise your hand. Yep, ten minutes. No, Councillor McLaughlin, are you for ten or not for ten? No, unanimous. Thank you. Ten minutes. Thank you. Sorry, against. Councillor Gale's against. Orbar, Councillor Gale, ten minutes. Thank you. Right. Councillor Smith, do you have a seconder for your motion? Yes. Councillor, sorry. Sorry, one moment. Uh oh, I'm in trouble. Oh, we have to wait for the public to come back. My, sorry. Do I have to report? Yeah. Oh, can't I just do this? Sorry, um, Deputy Mayor, I have to actually report back on the. Sorry. Oh. Everybody's back in. Thank you. So, council resolved the following: that, that oh, is that it. Do I have to actually say? I can't even read it. Yeah, you can. Do it. Uh, three, you, Madam Mayor. So, council resolved that council amend the Central Coast Policy for Procurement (CCC 005) to include additional local site supplier support. The council trial for a period of 12 months of local preference waiting for tenders, following the trial of further report to be tabled outlining the benefits costs and include a recommendation as to its continuation. The council apply the local preference waiting of 20% to the component of all tenders demonstrated as being sourced by local suppliers and include a financial in cap, impact cap of $150,000 GST exclusive per tender. And we also resolve to do it in confidential, which we are aware of. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Smith. There you go. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so the motion that I'm putting forward is about um, having some preliminary discussions with Newcastle Airport. And I would just note that probably over the last two years I've attended pr probably three presentations from Newcastle Airport in different capacities. Um, and it is clear that they are seeking to progress um, what is on offer up in Newcastle, um, but also they very much see the Central Coast as part of their catchment. And so they're very actively um, marketing and seeking to include uh, residents of the Central Coast as part of their base um, in terms of utilising the airport. This is in no way intended to be a motion about Central Coast Airport. It is in no way um, meant to impact Council's deliberations on Central Coast Airport and it is absolutely a clearly different circumstance and different situation. Um, Newcastle Airport has grown, as many people would understand, and many people utilise it now. It's certainly um, my preferred airport when there are flights available, just in terms of ease of access. Um, as councillors would know, it's next to Williamtown. Um, it's, it is currently undergoing um, some plans, some intended plans. It has a vision statement that looks at they're currently servicing the East Coast market, but they're looking at international flights depending on where they go forward. Um, the airport is owned by Port Stephens and Newcastle Council. Um, so this motion is about preliminary investigations. Um, I think um, if this motion goes anywhere, and it may not, it may not go anywhere, but if it does, then it would probably be a process over a year or two of actually identifying what the opportunities are and going through those discussions. It may just be about promotion of tourism, um, but it may be other opportunities that can service our business industry in terms of freight transport, which is an area that they want to focus on for growth. Um, so uh, the motion is put forward to give the CEO the opportunity to begin those preliminary discussions. It does intend that this is a very public and transparent process, if it goes anywhere, that there will be a further report come to back to this council. And then if there are further opportunities, I would expect they will go into the next council and be done um, through a process of reporting back other than any confidential commercial information. Um, so that's the basis of this motion. Um, and I would encourage and commend you to support it. Thank you. Councillor Holstein. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Look, I support the motion um, and I can just reiterate what uh, Councillor Smith said. It is not 
about Warner Vale. Uh, on the 19th of February, I think uh, there were three councillors, myself, Councillor Smith and Councillor Pillen, attended at the Springs a networking um, morning for Central Coast Tourism. The guest speaker was Mr Stephen Crow from Newcastle Airport. Mr Crow talked about the tourism opportunities that Newcastle Airport brings with a range of flights now coming in from New Zealand, other opportunities to expand, the possibility of heading towards Bali out of Newcastle. All these were initiatives that would see Newcastle grow at a capacity that's not available to Warner Vale. It's, it's not about Warner Vale, it's about Newcastle. And they were very much, as part of the presentation, about the support, yes, to the Hunter, yes, to Northern New South Wales, and most definitely, yes, of what it can bring to the Central Coast. They talked about new routes. They talked about new markets. And I recall in coming back from the event, I think I might have asked you, Mr Murphy, uh, are, were we aware of whether the Central Coast on a tourism aspect is appeal, uh, has information available at Newcastle Airport for those people coming in from overseas, particularly from New Zealand, that the Central Coast was available as a destination? We've all travelled at some point. We've all gone in through Sydney Airport. And if I one more time find about the... Blue Mountains, or I hear about the uh, Hunter wineries, nothing about the Central Coast. Well, here's Newcastle Airport. It's new, it's fresh, it's, it's building its capacity for new routes, new opportunities for tourism. Are we as the Central Coast promoting ourselves there as a destination for people coming in? And the figures uh, were suggesting that it was a lot of return travellers, family and that, but opportunities were growing in the new tourism market. Councillor Smith's motion is about looking at those opportunities. It is not in any way, and we are totally differently opposed when you talk about Warner Vale, that Newcastle Airport may be an opportunity to expand in aspects of tourism opportunity and that larger air freight, because that opportunity could exist and give benefit to local business. I ask you, councillors, put your thoughts on that aside of the arguments we've had about airports and talk about the opportunity that this has for us of advancing both economically for our tourism, for our businesses, and it's something we need to look at. It's something we need to consider. So I support the motion wholeheartedly. I think there's an opportunity there. And councillors, put aside everything else. This is about growth for the Central Coast. An opportunity there exists for us. We shouldn't miss that opportunity. Councillor Pillen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would like to ask uh, the Deputy Mayor Jane Smith and Councillor Holston just on an, an amendment, please. Um, I know this has been declined, but I haven't actually put it up at this stage. Um, well, hang on. Are you asking for an amendment? You uh, want to add to theirs yeah, or you I want to commend, put in a full amendment? Yeah, I, I do really commend this uh, motion. I would like to see if they would accept an amendment. Otherwise, I will run with an amendment myself. Now, you um, want an addition to, item? Yes, so yep. two points, please. So point four, they're up on the screen now. The council requests the CEO to also investigate a two-way relationship between Newcastle and Warnervale airports and provide opportunities where these airports may benefit and complement each other. And five, that council requests the CEO to provide in his report the opportunities that Warnervale airport can benefit the Central Coast region and surrounding areas, please. No, not moving it. Not, won't accept that. Well, we, Councillor Holston, I'm just cautious. We've got two minutes. Very quickly. I understand the council's got to come from. And maybe that's a progression of where this may well go and take. You put that up now, all you're going to do is polarise the bait. We're going to go back to our argument on, 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 on water bar, and it's going to be either black or white, and you don't go. Allow it to move forward. I'm not saying that the opportunity of having a relationship at some stage might be there. For a whole range of reasons it might, for a whole range of reasons it mightn't. But by adding those two extra motions, you're polarising the debate and the opportunity. This is just, it's everything or nothing. This is the problem. There's no compromise in this council. I think you're alienating the opportunity of getting the motion to move forward. You're missing it. If you put that in, I can tell you where a majority of the councillors will go. No. They'll say absolutely no and it's gone. But if that's what you want to see happen, then you'll move an amendment and nothing. But the motion, I think, is purely and utterly about opportunities through the Newcastle. 
And I support the other things, but this isn't going to get you anywhere. Mm. So I, so I support Councillor Smith in not accepting that as an addendum. So Councillor Pillant, do you, oh. in one minute, do you want to move that as an amendment? Just very quickly, um, they aim to a compromise then just to go with point four and not five, otherwise I will move the amendment for both of them. I think they've rejected both, both? points. Okay, yeah, I'll move that, please. Mm, that? Okay. Thank you. We'll speak and to your I'll amendment. Speak to it, thank you. In 30 seconds. Yep, uh, look, very quickly, uh, as I said, I did commend the motion. However, I would really love to see an all-encompassing report. Yes, I was at the um, tourism, Listen to the guest presenter, Stephen Crow. Yes, new routes, new markets, aviation's role in market development and tourism opportunities. We had Ben Morgan come here and speak tonight um, and he spoke about how Warnervale is a revenue generating airport and potentially up to half a billion dollars business hub. This, and also how it provides for our emergency services. This should not be about um, what others can do for us. It should be all encompassing and what we can do for ourselves and also what we can do for the Newcastle region as well. We're a general aviation hub. We're nothing like Newcastle. They are looking to uh, expand their runway and expand their international uh, flights. And so this should be something where we're complementing each other and looking for opportunities of where we can work together. We have what we're providing here on the Central Coast they have what they're providing in Newcastle. And how can we try and complement each other? You talk about compromising. I'm trying to compromise. I think this is great, everything that we're trying to hear about from Newcastle, but also what we can actually do to complement them with what we currently have. So I would um, like to see people support this. If it doesn't go ahead, I will still support what's, what you're seeking from Newcastle because I think it's good, but I think we can't dismiss what we're trying to do for our own region ourselves and for others with what we have at General Aviation. Airport. In the essence of time, you're seconding that, Councillor Marquette. Okay, I think it's pretty clear. So I'm going to put the amendment as moved by Councillor Pill and seconded by Councillor Marquette, just so that we can get this through. Uh, all those in favour of the amendment, please raise your hand. Councillor Marquette, Councillor Burke, Councillor Pill and Councillor McLaughlin. All those against? Councillor Holston, Councillor Smith, Can sorry? You're abstaining. Councillor Smith, Councillor Vincent, Councillor Sunstrom, Councillor Mertens, Councillor Hogan, Councillor McGregor, Councillor Greenway. The amendment's lost. Can I just call division? Oh, uh, yeah. Good really? Yeah. Division. The, all those for the amendment, please stand. <laughs> Councillor Marquette, Burke, Pillen, and McLaughlin. All those against? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Greenaway, McGregor, Hogan, Mertens, Sunstrom, Vincent, uh -huh. Smith. Matthews, abstentions, Councillor Holstein, it's not going to stand. Thank you. Now the, I'm, I'm just going to put the motion as moved by Councillor Smith, second by, yeah. sorry, Councillor Holstein, all those in favour, please raise your hand. So Councillor Holstein, Councillor Smith, Councillor Vincent, Sunstrom, Mertens, Hogan, McGregor, Greenaway, Pillen and Burke, all those against? Councillor Marquette, what are you doing, Councillor McLaughlin, tonight? Quick, you got one second. An abstention by Councillor McLaughlin. I declare the motion carried. Councillors, the meeting is closed. However, it would be remiss of me not to farewell Dr. Liz. It's her last meeting tonight. And on behalf of. Well, tears are on mine. Um, I just want to say thank you, Liz, for what you have brought to this council. And you know certainly what you've done for me in my capacity as mayor, and you will not be forgotten. You will be sorely missed. And on behalf of myself and the fellow councillors, we will wish you very well in your new endeavours, whatever they may be. I now declare the meeting closed. Thank you, councillors. You didn't want to.